President of ASBM University and esteemed Chair of the Conference, Professor Dr. Vishwajit Patnayak, Vice Chancellor of ASBM University and Co-Chair of the Conference, Professor Kalyan Shankar Roy, Pro Vice Chancellor of ASBM University, Professor Pal Palgu Niranjana, esteemed Chair and Co-Chair of the Session, Convener and Coordinator of the Conference, Delegates, members of faculty and staff, and my student colleagues. This is Shadalam Khan, a student of BBA second year at ASBM University. Very good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you to the second technical session of the conference on building resilience, the way forward. Professor Sok Uttara will be chairing the session. Dr. Uttara is the vice president for the internal quality assurance and internal audit, as well as a professor in Kamek Business School. Dr. Uttara has worked as academic dean of education and English for 20 years. He used to be a prominent member of the National Committee of Doctoral Degree Program Preparations, and interim director of Department of Standards and Accreditation of the Accreditation Committee of Cambodia, a team leader of ACC assessors, and a consultant to the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport, and several INGOs. Dr. Uttara holds an educational leadership and management specializing in quality assurance from De La Salle University, Manila. Professor Abul Azam is the co-chair of the session after completing a PhD in economics at Duke University. In USA, Professor Abul H. Azam started his academic career in the USA at the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. After a lifelong working experience in the USA, he came back to Bangladesh in 2015 as the Dean of the School of Business and Economics at the United International University. He has published in various report journals in the USA and authored a book on the efficiency of government subsidy in the economy. He is deeply interested in program development and quality assurance in tertiary education. Currently, he's working as professor and advisor accreditation at East West University. I now request Professor Uttara to give introduction to the session. Please, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Dan Alam, for your very uh, uh, informative and very kind uh, words in the introduction of myself. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Abul Azam. I'm very glad to meet you again uh, during this time, uh, especially. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Mac Dalin, uh, Peter. And good afternoon, everybody uh, who is in the uh, international conference today. Well, uh, as you know, um, oh, sorry. And uh, my best regard to uh, Professor Dr. Biswajit uh, Patnak for his invitation uh, of me to join this international conference. Um, unfortunately, I cannot join in person, but uh, luckily one of my colleagues can join uh, the conference in India in person right now. So he can represent our school uh, at the moment uh, uh, in the physical conference. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, well, as you know, um, uh, higher education has been affected so badly by the uh, presence of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, since uh, early 2020. Uh, um, everywhere, um, everyone in the world has been uh, affected by this uh, pandemic. But uh, we have been able to struggle at the same time survive and also lately progress through the hardship. Um, we have done our best to uh, meet the challenges of uh, um, uh, the challenges of the uh, pandemic by finding various methods to uh, uh, address the issues uh, I guess you institutions as well as my institution have uh, adopted a number of uh, we'll go from here. 
platforms in order to facilitate totally the uh, delivery. Um, for example, we use Zoom, we use um, Microsoft Meet uh, team like now, we use Google Meet, we use many other platforms as found appropriate for uh, different situations. In Cambodia, uh, Google Meet, Zoom, uh, these two are the most popular platforms for delivery. While uh, Google, uh, Google Classroom is used a lot for asynchronous uh, uh, delivery, um, Zoom and uh, Google Meet are used for uh, live teaching. And uh, also we use many other supplemental platforms to facilitate the teaching and assessment. Well, uh, this is not this is not very different from other countries in the world uh, that they adopted uh, their, their uh, uh, platforms and uh, technology to uh, use in response to the presence of the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So here we have come to the third year uh, of this uh, period challenging period. And so we have built a stronger capacity to uh, address the issue. And that comes to the topic about resilience. Uh, so we have been uh, able to build our resilience uh, in response. And we have gone beyond the survival stage to the developmental stage. Now, uh, we are all familiar with the situation and with the new adoption of the uh, technology uh, that is very instrumental for uh, all institutions to uh, use to, in order to keep ourselves and keep our services going on and not only going on, but uh, continuing to I'm sorry, I got cut a moment ago. Can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. Yes. Sir, we can hear you, sir. sir All we right. Can see you. Yes. That's, that's great. So uh, today is the best opportunity for us to listen to uh, our speakers um, in, in the international conference uh, organized by uh, ASBM. So, and, uh, Professor Azam, uh, as a co-chair of this session, is going to share his insights about our theme, resilience, uh, as well. Uh, uh, so um, I would like to um, leave this opp opportunity uh, for Professor Azam uh, to please share your insights and welcome our presenters. Uh, Professor Azam. Thank you, sir. I now request Professor Abul Azam to address the gathering. Hello. Please. Thank you. Now I'm asking, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you, for Dr. Tanayok and the organizers for inviting me to co-chair this uh, session on resilience. <clears throat> and thanks for organizing such a wonderful conference uh, on an issue, burning issue right now. This uh, resilience has become the buzzword of the day, as you know. Since, as Dr. Tara said, COVID-19 outbreak, a 
academicians and practitioners have produced a large number of published work as the struggle went on. The resilience of an entity, individual or organization, is its ability to adapt to changes in the environment within which it functions, both anticipated and unanticipated, and whether through the shock and remain on course. It is a matter of capacity to withstand shocks. As such, in my opinion, it falls within the realm of capacity building. And resilience uh, is a multidimensional concept Resilience of an individual, resilience of market, resilience of buyers, resilience of organizations, resilience of economies, so on and so forth. Resilience of each of these entities or subgroups are intertwined with each other and within each subgroup, there are interlinked processes. Take, for example, an organization. The framework for attaining resilience must cover all processes and functions, HR, supply chain, production operations management, marketing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, attaining resilience needs a mindset instead of relying on doing things as usual and do not fix it if it is not functioning at the time. One has to anticipate and be prepared if it happens. It may require allocating resources towards achieving a resilient organization. Now, we have this afternoon 32 research papers on the topic. I'm sure all of us will go back home with some new brilliant ideas. Thank you. Thank you for the presenters, uh, 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 because we, we will access your mind on this topic through this conference. Thanks for participating. Thank you, sir. I request Nisha Singh, student master of ceremony, and my colleague to take over. Please, Nisha. Thank you, Shadi. A very warm good afternoon to all the participants here. So, with the permission of the chair now, we shall begin the paper presentations. So the first paper is being presented by Wu Dang Man and Dr. Famdan Khan from National Economics University, Vietnam. We'll proceed to the next participants. We have Olga Masilova and Vasily Piatin from Neurosciences Research Institute, Samara State Medical University, Russia. Olga. Sir, sir, you have been changed to presenter, sir. Sir, also, sir, you have been changed to presenter, sir. Can you please uh, present yourself? Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, can you help with my presentation or uh, must I upload myself? Ma'am, you can share. Uh, so there is a share button there. You can share the PPT on there.
Mm -hmm. I can't I switch can't uh, on my presentation. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, uh, there is an arrow mark over there. It's open share tray is there. Can you see that? You need to click on that. After that, you will be able to share your screen. I try to do it. <laughs> Yes, your screen is visible now. Now you can go to your folder where you kept your uh, file uh, PPTs. Yes, yes, yes. Now it's visible. Uh, uh, do you see my presentation? Yes, yes, ma'am. We yes. can see your presentation. Visible. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Olga Maslova. I am the head of the Neurosociology Laboratory of the Neurosciences Research Institute of Samara State Medical University. I'm happy to take part in this conference and I would like to talk about talent management in the organizational res resilience of personnel and about technology innovations we use in our Neurosciences Research Institute. Uh, at the current time, as well as in the future, talent management is a creative force for the organizational resilience of the company's personnel, as it identifies, develops, engages, retains and distributes talented people of all levels of the company's human resource system. This is of particular value for creating uh, strategically sustainable success and personal resilience in the uncertain organization environment. Talent management strategy is a continuous process focused on attracting and retaining the best talent in order to achieve organizational goals, remain competitive and create a sustainable business. There are a number of uh, challenges involved in attracting and retaining talents, such as uh, the first adaptability. Companies can no longer operate uh, solely on the principle of command and control, but most focus on the principle of sense and respond. Companies will need to focus on employers' adaptability quotient, which focuses on resilience and flexibility to ensure they are ready and able to evolve uh, no matter the conditions. The second uh, challenge is uh, rapid innovations and digitalization. Strategic uh, workforce planning to establish a so-called future resilience leading to a broader skill universe and skill-based talent management. The third challenge is lack of qualified talent. Managing to attract top talents and reskill existing workforce. 58% uh, of organizations are redesigning their organization to become more people-centric. Uh, there are several innovations, uh, technology innovations, uh, which we use in our Neurosciences Research Institute of Samara State Medical University. Uh, the main technologies are widely used is virtual reality. Uh, let me introduce you the first method. Uh, at the stage of recruiting new talent, we use the psychodiagnostic program in virtual reality, which consists of the job interview and uh, some work frames. This program allows to estimate behavior during stress, stress situations, uh, personal qualities and skills, and to complete the personal psychological portrait. Uh, the next one, uh, it is uh, the technology innovation um, consists uh, the employee training for soft skills in virtual reality. And we developed the public speaking training in virtual reality. 
uh, you know, virtual reality shows uh, tremendous promise for simulation training for soft skills such as leadership, diversity, equity and inclusion, interpersonal skills, uh, reduce fear of public speaking. A soft skills study found that people using virtual reality content platform could train four times faster than in a classroom. They were two times more confident in a applying the new skills and three times more emotionally connected to content than classroom learners. The next one, uh, another technology innovation uh, we use is uh, virtual reality for leadership development, talent training in social virtual reality platforms. It is a new and very modern to tool which can better support smart work. Uh, another technology innovation uh, is virtual reality for soft skill skills training, empathy development for leadership in virtual reality. Empathy is the most important leadership skill. It is known that virtual reality was described as the ultimate empathy machine since it allows people to experience anything from another person's point of view. Virtual reality has the power to help leaders experience and manage emotional leadership situations in a way that no other tool or learning technique can. The next one, um, it is a quantum leap in our neurosciences research institute. It is an innovation of our neurosociology laboratory. It is the one laboratory in Russia. Uh, so we uh, study the neural leadership. You know, the uh, leadership is not just a socially constructed element, but also a social brain constructed phenomenon that requires an understanding of the human brain as a social organ. Uh, this unique innovation is brain-to-brain -brain synchronization setup. It is um, used in neural leadership uh, to define leader-follow interactions and leader-follow positions uh, of the personnel. Also, we use this innovation for selection of team members, of crews members. We use 32 channels electroencephalograph set up for brain uh, hyperscanning. Also, we use eye tracker, uh, heart rate variability, galvanic skin reaction, and other physiological markers. At this slide, you can see the visual presentation of the interbrain correlation. The smoother the line between brains, the higher the interbrain correlation. And uh, the last technology innovation I would like to tell you about is NeuroChat tool for neural leadership development of the personal. NeuroChat is a tool for the interpersonal neuro communication, for neural leadership development and neuro management in general. NeuroChat allows to type text on the computer screen or select ready-made commands without using speech or movements. The user, uh, concentrating on the required symbol on the virtual keyboard, receives a mental choice of the subject. So letter by letter or choosing ready-made words a person types the whole sentence. Uh, the person uses only his brain and his eyes. Uh, so uh, that's all I would like to tell you about our work. And I hope that my speech was very interesting for you. Uh, my colleagues and I will be very happy to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Olga Mas uh, Maslova and Professor Vasily. Thank you uh, for your you. Uh, for your very uh, insightful uh, presentation, touching on the uh, use of technology, teaching the students the soft skills that uh, the machines can compete. That's another very um, effective 
way to uh, deal with the situation and to build on the uh, resilience uh, capacity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. May I invite uh, the next speaker, please? Thank you, ma'am. You can stop request, presenting the uh, screen. I would request, uh, ma'am, all the ma'am, can you please unshare your slide? Unshare, unshare your screen, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Coming up next, we have Dr. Magdalene Peter and Dr. Praveen Kumar S., Professor and Dean, School of Commerce and Management, BIHER, Chennai. Good afternoon, everyone. Just a moment, I'm just sharing my screen. Can you uh, see my uh, screen, ma'am? Yes, yes, yes ma'am, we, we can see, see we can see it. Yes, thank you so much. Good afternoon, all dignitaries. Uh, I am Dr. Magdalene Peter, HOD MBA, uh, Bharat Institute of uh, Higher Education and Research. And my co-author is Dr. Praveen Kumar S., Professor and Dean of School of Commerce and Management. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my paper. So um, the paper title is all about re revolutionizing Indian education system through national education policy 2020, a critical review. The introduction is the quality education is the foundation and building block for exploring the zenith of human potential. As you we see, education is the fundamental need for the society to develop uh, people who have an equitable and rational environment and grow with a value system and character which can contribute towards nation building. In India, if you see, uh, towards in the backdrop of nation building, it is very important to note that India is one of the largest human capital pool provided in terms of technical and management leadership to the world over. So it will be quite rational to expect by next decade that India will be number one and will be again with the world's largest population of young people to necessitate a provisioning for them to have a quality education wherein they are put in a competitive environment and they can thrive in that international arena is what we can give our children, our student, our future generation, which will give them the backbone to support themselves in their future uh, career. The scope of this paper is to critically analyze the effectiveness of national education policy and review the way forward in implementing it. So the overview of some of the basic fundamentals of the National Education Policy 2020 is, number one, is to be focused on diversity and local context while giving emphasis in all aspects of curriculum, pedagogy, and policy to provide equity to be inclusive, inclusive while being the cornerstone of all educational decisions, to promote community participation, thereby uplifting philanthropic venture commitment in the field of education, effective utilization of advancement in technology in teaching, learning, and removing language barriers, curriculum and learning based on conceptual understanding rather than uh, a mere rote learning just for the sake of examinations, effort to identify unique capabilities to recognize and tap them effectively and efficiently, the curriculum based on critical thinking and creativity, where probably it could be based on the Bloom's taxonomy, where the cognitive skills of the students are more developed so as to boost a logical decision making ability, which is enhanced with efficiency and innovation. 
continuous and constant reviews from time to time so as to be well updated with the time. The policy is built on sustained research and regular assessment by educated experts. The major takeaways from the papers are the universal in universalization of access for possible early childhood care to education to secondary level education. Students acquire more practical knowledge than mere rote learning. It provides an increased flexibility to the students in choosing the subject of their choice. <coughs> the shortcomings of this uh, uh, NEP could be stated as uh, the policy provisions uh, uh, a choice for the students to exit or drop out of or to re-enroll with right to education till class 12. It could have been better to remove the exit and make education compulsory till 18 years of age. While present education infrastructure is suspect to provisioning basic educational access, provisioning of digital aid and learning through digital learning schools on computers are uncertain and need to be deliberated more with focus on practical aspects than mere theoretical teaching. While digital, digitizing the classrooms it is, uh, is promoted, it has to be clearly charted out how it is likely to be implemented that is conspicuously silent. So the NOP as law, in conclusion, I would conclude that the NOP has a lot of promises for transforming the education field by promoting participatory, holistic, and inclusive approach into modern education system. The present policy, unlike the previous ones, is the outcome of extensive field experiences, factual research, feedback of stakeholders, and lessons learned from best practices, thereby leads to a progressive step towards scientific approach to education. Some of the references that was referred are given here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Dr. Matt, Dalin, Peter, and uh, Dr. Praveen uh, Kumas. Uh, that's another very interesting topic about uh, reviewing the policy on Indian education. And you found out that uh, education uh, in India should uh, uh, re uh, revitalize on the uh, uh, the way uh, the curriculum is uh, conducted. It should it, it should focus more on practicality so that the students will have uh, more opportunities to actually practice what they've learned uh, from the from the technology as well as conceptual conceptual understanding. That's a very good point. Uh, and from the practicality aspect, uh, they will develop critical thinking and uh, creativity skills. Uh, so um, in order to um, advance the technology, it's important to di digitalize uh, classrooms. So that's, uh, uh, those are very good uh, points that you found out in, uh, in your study. Thank you so much. Let's move Thank on. Thank you so much, sir. Thank presenter. you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Coming up next, we have Lyudmila Zakharova, Irina Leonova, and Olga Masilova from Lovaksky State University of Nizhny Novgorod, Russia. I now request Lyudmila Zakharova, Irina Leonova, and Olga Masilova from Lovakisky State University of Nizhny Novgorod, Russia, to present their piece. We shall proceed. So next up, we have Lethi Lone and Dr. Vu Van Nok 
from National Economics University, Vietnam. will proceed and i now call out mr shaheed khan ms frida maria and dr r kanan from madurai kamraj university tamil nadu hey thank you and uh, uh thank you for the opportunity and i'll be quick here uh, for the benefit of the chair and the co-chair i am discussing uh, a particular failure in a merger between an Indian company called Yatra.com and an American software company called Ebix, wherein in uh, 2019, in the summer months of 2019, Ebix made a phenomenal offer to Yatra.com and OTA to take it over for about $336 million. And what happened after that was something that no corporate entity should go through. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what happens next is something very uh, peculiar because the research objectives and the methodologies that we have fixed is very clear. What was the agreement between the two entities, the functional efficacy, and uh, what were the reasons for the failure of a phenomenal deal that had happened and how to avoid a few certain things of this kind. The methodology we adopted was to talk with the executives of both the entities in a very structured and open manner such that we are able to delve into the details. We also took support of two finance experts to understand, and we went through all the uh, the literature that was available with the Securities Exchange Commission of USA, which is quoted online. And of course, towards the end of the deal that never happened, uh, Yatra.com of India appeals in a court in the USA. We also went through the papers that were presented in the court of USA and also the various interviews given by the promoters of the two companies across television channels that were available as archival material. The implications of our study is not very simplistic, but it's it's quite complicated actually when you read the complete paper as to how mergers and acquisitions would impact organizations. And of course, one very important aspect that we studied was managerial hubris. Uh, some of you may be hearing it for the first time. Managerial hubris is a scenario wherein a particular entity has so much of confidence that you can actually dub it as overconfident, as overconfidence. And another implication of the study was our suggestions with regard to what type of an acquisition should have been done in the future. The, the primary limitations of this particular paper is we are just studying two entities, that is Ebix and uh, and Yatra.com. And uh, of course, Ebix is also present in India in a very big way as a software entity, as a financial entity. And uh, of course, uh, this particular research was done as of the data available as on the 30th of July, because this paper had to be submitted in uh, 2021 August. So we had restricted ourselves to that. I will showcase it to you in the next slides. And of course, the angle of litigation went on even beyond the purview of the timeline that was set for us to submit the paper. And another huge limitation was the times of COVID. As our chairman for the session rightly pointed out the kind of difficulties we have had. Talking to the associates, the executives of the organizations was quite difficult because they were primarily reeling of losses as far as their company was concerned. As far as the uh, two entities are concerned, our I mean, our idea was to study the business combinations as, as enunciated by the Harvard University professor, Professor Benjamin uh, Karis Gomes, and uh, in his phenomenal book called Remix Strategy. And we thought that this was a phenomenal marriage that took place, but unfortunately landed up in a divorce even before the marriage was consumed. And uh, another important aspect for us to understand today is that both the companies were acquiring a lot of companies before this very prospective merger was to happen. Uh, e uh, Yatra had acquired seven entities and uh, they actually got acquired through a SPAC, that is the Special Purpose Acquisition Company in the US and got listed in NASDAQ, though they are not listed in, in India. After the failed merger, Ebix was able to collaborate and merge with four entities. Okay. Ebix as such, if you see the, I mean, on the right side, 
they wanted to get into the digital world, which is more of the physical and digital. So finance related, this software company called Ebix had acquired 13 entities, travel related six, health and insurance, plus they had acquired four entities in all, which means 24 entities in total, uh, 23 entities in total. Look at the beauty of this particular statement we are trying to make. This is a comparison. Uh, we had submitted the paper by the 10th of August 2021 last year. On that day, when the deal was not consummated, the share price of Yatra, which is on the left, 10th of August 21, had gone down to $1.92, listed on, uh, on uh, NASDAQ. And look at uh, the EBIC share, which was almost about $50, had come down to 30.98. Look at it as of yesterday. I mean, I purposely uh, got into the site of NASDAQ to understand whether there has been an improvement. In fact, uh, Yatra.com, though it is doing very well in India, on NASDAQ, it has actually gone down in relation to what it was on the 10th of August 2021. So as of yesterday, this is 7.46 p.m. local time US. It was $1.92, whereas EBIX was hovering around $33 per se. So what do we say? I mean, uh, in the five minutes that has been allocated to me, what do we actually conclude? Do we actually need to conclude is the question that we as uh, research scholars want to place. Was the due diligence done in a proper way by EBIX? The, the biggest reason that we come to a conclusion as far as this particular deal, which led to a failure, was the managerial hubris, the overconfidence that the promoter of uh, EBIX had unto himself. Uh, that actually led to the fall of uh, this particular deal and the later uh, court cases that went into the courts of Delaware in US. And of course, uh, Yatra.com lost a lot of its uh, she, its sheen, its value as far as its existence was concerned. COVID also took away a huge amount of share as far as uh, this particular deal is happened. Look at item number four. Uh, thanks to COVID, of course, we have had a wonderful paper with regard to talent development, which was presented from Russia, wherein they spoke about talent development. You'll be surprised in a lot of management jargon that is coming up. Force major has, I mean, he's becoming a legal, uh, you know, clause in all the contracts, in all the agreements. In fact, we are given to understand after having gone through the papers of uh, uh, the Yatra and Ebix deal that the force major clause was not done as suited to a scenario like COVID, the pandemic, because nobody expected the pandemic to happen because this deal had come through in the summer months of 2019 and it fell through in June, July of 2020. So when you look at it from that perspective, it is very clear that these clauses must and should be introduced in deals of this kind because this deal itself was to the tune of $337 million, you know, American. So when we look at it, the finality of the EBIX Yatra deal is, though the deal never went through, both the organizations suffered, but the major sufferer was the Indian company called Yatra.com. Thank you. I'm stopping to share. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Shahid uh, Khan. Uh, that's uh, another uh, very interesting topic uh, about the mergers and uh, uh, acquisition, transition of uh, OTA, uh, the comparison between uh, uh, Yatra and uh, and the Ibis. That's an interesting uh, question. Uh, sorry, topic. Everybody, uh, let, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat box. Then we will address the questions to the presenters later. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I now call out Vyudang Man and Dr. Fandang Khan from National Economics University, Vietnam. I now call out Lethi Lone and Dr. Vu Van Nuok from National Economics University, Vietnam. Heading forward, 
I now request Dr. T. G. Vijay and Dr. Umesh Chandra Shekhar from PhD Institute of Management, Coimbatore, India, to present their piece. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I suppose you can hear me. Am yes, I audible? Sir, right. Yes, okay. Sir, Thank you very are. much for the opportunity. Uh, I am Dr. Umesh Chandra Shekhar, and my colleague Vijay have done this paper together. Uh, this is uh, uh, a paper aimed at management education, and the title is Have We the Need to Create Resilience Among Gen Z Students in a Management School? Uh, the first uh, literature review indicative says, what are the key characteristics we look for in a resilient individual? That is summed up by Block and Kerman, and they say optimism, zest, energetic approach to life, curiosity, openness, and high positive emotionalities are some requirements of a resilient individual. Now we are in a business school, we need to train people to get into their careers. What do organizations want? And that Shen et al. have captured very well. They say that today's organizations need employees who can face unprecedented changes, adapt successfully to the challenging roles and the tasks and situations they have to handle. And the pandemic is a perfect example uh, in question. Finally, uh, the awareness that the present curriculum system or the present pedagogy and the present program designs do not really meet this, uh, this requirement of resilience was reflected by Crow et al. Uh, Crow et al. in 2019 when they presented the fact that there is a serious lack of uh, abilities in terms of residence capacities in business school graduates. And that we have to now ensure that we develop pedagogical interventions which embeds resilience. This is the starting point of our paper and of our presentation. The key objectives which we had when we started the study was A, to find out what is the perception of management students on the key constructs of resilience. The first part was this. The second part was, can we understand the students' perspectives as to the current work from home situation and their perception about their life skills? This study was done in September, October 2021, when the second year students came to the campus for the first time. The entire two semesters prior to that was an online learning experience for them. And this was the first week when they came to a physical campus after a year long hiatus. The third point was, can we understand the shift in the quotients? Uh, we know intelligence quotients, we know emotional quotients. There's something called the social quotient, which is now coming into, into four. And more importantly, what the pandemic has also brought out is what we call the adversity quotient. How good am I in handling adversities when I come to that? This was the third point we wanted to understand. And finally, we wanted to figure out a model. How can we incorporate these elements of resilience into a modern management education curriculum? The first sorry, thing Professor to Umesh, yes. I'm sorry yes, to sir. interrupt you. Your slides don't seem to be moving. Can you please oh check my God, on I'm that? sorry about it. <laughs> well, uh, bear with me. I shall have to relaunch it again. Uh, okay, where was I, uh, Professor? You were on the first page. Okay, <laughs> my apologies. Okay, uh, I shall not then do a presentation. I just uh, scroll through the slide so that's easier for you. Okay, so uh, the literature review which we, we uh, sum summarize here is this. What are the key characteristics we require to uh, as a resident individual? And, you know, Kerman and Tohan have, have said that optimism, zest, energetic approach life, curiosity, openness to new experiences, and high positive emotionalities are some requirements. And today, organizations also have a need for resident employees who are competent to face the changes and the VOCA environment which businesses uh, are facing constantly. That's from Shin et al. And finally, Roe et al. in 2019 identified that there is a serious gap in management education in terms of training students or business graduates to have the level of competence to deal with resilience and to deal with life changes. And therefore, business schools need to develop pedagogical interventions which embed resilience. This was the basis and starting point of our, of our uh, study. Uh, the first point, which was that we need to understand what is the perception of management students on the key constructs of resilience. Then we need to understand what are the students' perspective as to the current work from home situation and the perceptions about the life skills. 
this study was undertaken in September, October of 2021. Uh, this was the second year students. They had never come to the institute at all. It was a virtual session for them for one year. So after one year of online learning, they in fact saw the campus for the first time. Third most important thing which we also try to understand with this was, what is the equation between intelligence quotient emotional quotient, social quotient, and now what has come to the fore is called the adversity quotient, which means how do I deal with adverse situations? How do I deal with adversities? And that, in a sense, AQ reflects what I call the true resilience of the individual. And finally, having understood this, we also wanted to figure out a model, a working model, which we could use to incorporate elements of resilience building into our pedagogy and curriculum. This was the objective of the study. Uh, like I said, we studied the final students, about 172 students. We have a very good gender mix, 50-50, and we used a modified version of the residence at work uh, questionnaire by Winwood et al., which has seven main constructs. We also supplemented this questionnaire with a second set of questions, which looked at online social engagement, study from home stress, performance in study from home, work-life balance in work from home situation, preferences for a hybrid teaching and learning program, life skill assessment, and own health condition. A five-point Likert scale was used, and like I said, an online questionnaire in a physical classroom setting was, was also uh, used to uh, get the uh, survey responses. The key findings of this particular survey indicates that, you know, uh, when things go wrong at work, it usually tends to overshadow the other parts of students' life. Over half of them agreed with the statement. And they also agreed with the statement that negative people at my place of work or learning tends to pull me down. And the factor of 33% we are using here is that because we have a student strength of about 600 students in the campus, if you extrapolate this to 33%, that means 200 students, uh, uh, if they express a view, that's a very important factor for us to consider to incorporate into our teaching learning strategies. In the supplementary question, something interesting also came out. 60% respondents said that they found studying from home was more stressful. And 82% of respondents felt that they need help with developing soft skills. The second part, which was which was much more relevant for us, was that we wanted to also find out is there a gender perception difference, and in fact, if there is, uh, the gender perception difference is that uh, women tend to appreciate more as to what they have in the current place of learning than men. Almost one is to two, and when things go wrong at work, they carry it home. This is both both genders do that. But negative people seem to bring men respondents much more down than women. And women also state that they have a higher, uh, you know, engagement in terms of uh, reliable network and support in the place of learning compared to men. And finally, no event at my place of learning phases me for long. That means the impact of something happening in the institute upsets or affects the person. More men get affected than women. So there is a very clear gender differences. And it would seem to suggest from this primary study that women tend to be more resilient than men as it as far it comes to the management students at PhD Institute of Management, final thought. Now, having used this particular life skill uh, requirement, we have proposed a model that we are using the UNICEF model of 2018, which is designed for school children, but we found that extremely relevant in terms of engaging our curriculum and uh, program design towards this particular resilience building skills. So the four components you have split up into 10 elements, and these are already incorporated in our syllabus to a large extent. So the factors of resilience, as far as an MBA student is concerned, is mindfulness, delivery, engagement, and productivity. And these can be driven by this particular box of life skill en enhancements. And that is where the position lies at this point of time. Now, what are the conclusions we have drawn from this particular study? Management educators need to prepare Gen Alpha and Gen Z for the real world situation. Most of our students are coming straight from college. They have no work experience. So that is very important for us. The second thing is the mindfulness, emotional intelligence, and resilience matrix is a good place to start. The third thing is curriculum, program elements, and delivery will have to embrace the skill development and go beyond traditional learning. The fourth thing is that there are gender differences in handling resilience. Customization will be required in terms of program delivery. And finally, the national education policy, which was referred to by an earlier presenter, states clearly that life skills such as communication, cooperation, teamwork, and resilience 
has to be part of the curriculum. Therefore, I think this particular presentation uh, bears witness to the fact that adoption of this strategy will also help in creating communication, cooperation, teamwork, and resilience. Uh, thank you very much for this time. And I shall just share the references and uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Umesh uh, Chandra Sekha. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, time for questions, but as it is very interesting, I would like to ask one short question and please be very brief on your answer. Yes, uh, it's Yeah, I understand that you are uh, proposing uh, a uh, uh, more focus on AQ but uh, not forget about EQ, SQ as well. So uh, my question is, how do we educators uh, integrate all of these together? Because we cannot miss any one of them. Yes, you are right. Uh, we, uh, in our, in, at PSIM, we have IQ testing. We, we, we have IQ embedded in our processes. We have a mandatory subject in EQ. It's compulsory for all students to have a paper on EQ. SQ is by activity-based learning, and AQ is something we're introducing now in, in, our, in our platform. I'll be happy to share with you in detail what we're doing in all the four areas. It's a it's an integrated approach. Sir. It can't be in isolation. They're all building blocks for each other. All four have to go together. That's uh, so brief, but uh, very clear. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please uh, pose your questions if you have in the uh, chat box then uh, we will uh, i will share the questions with the uh, presenters and invite them to answer your questions if you have any thank you thank let's you. proceed to the thank other you. presenter thank you. thank you thank you sir i now request miss punima lingam from s r m i s t university of management chennai to present their, her piece We shall proceed and I know, now call out Dr. Rajesh Khajuria and Anket Dinesh Pai Shah, ACBSP USA, to present their piece. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, sir, and everyone over here. This is um, Dr. Ankisha on this side. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, present on uh, resilience in education, the intersection of challenges and the opportunities. I beg to speak, uh, sir. Uh, your uh, screen is not visible, sir. Uh, is it now visible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, first of all, I will like to uh, uh, say something about the resilience. Resilience, what uh, I mean is uh, fa uh, the the belief in uh, faith and skills. Uh, during the COVID period and after that, there is a these resilience. What is now coming up? Frequently, resilience. I believe that it should. Have, uh, it's a faith and skills uh, which is required. Uh, these are the challenges which is faced uh, by the Indian education institution during the post-COVID areas. First of all, it was the technological challenge where we need to uh, we need to deliver the uh, like several challenges uh, regarding the digital tools and technologies for learning, assessments, and communications. Uh, there's also a demographic challenges uh, with, uh, which education sector is uh, facing uh, due to the expectations uh, expectation uh, of uh, uh, parents and the students. Uh, every academic institution is now uh, having the uh, application challenge as well. So because of the uh, adoption of because of the poor digital adoption, campus placements and uh, uh, the uh, other uh, barriers which are uh, 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 coming up in adopting the uh, changes. 
there are also these education sector is uh, still uh, in their uh, uh, the under the regulatory uh, bodies so they are having sometimes uh, less flexibility of uh, customizing innovating and adapting the new things agar in the financial challenges due to the uh, covid there were uh, drop in number of students drop in admissions as well as uh, fees challenges as well uh operational uh, challenges are still um, there on uh, due to uh, the in engaging the students uh, and uh, um due to their physical absence and uh, keeping the faculty motivation as well so these are the basic challenges which are faced by the indian education institution during the post covid area uh these are the opportunities which are i i meant to ad- identify where uh, we can encash uh the opportunity so that we can deliver the best to the students it's a deflate the long he- held beliefs in the traditional academic model we uh, new nep is also talking about the multidisciplinary so this a uh, multidisciplinary is uh, also a uh, a multi basement learning model can help the students to develop themselves and uh, the vital skills such as critical thinking teamwork and creativity we have to reinvent the student environment as well because earlier uh, the students were coming to campus now uh, they, they are not coming to a campus and uh, it was uh, like uh, attaching the remote learning uh we should try to adopt a digital ready institute where uh, these uh, institutions are left with no option but to be digital read, uh, ready and lastly the opportunity is to have the multi stakeholder ecosystem where all of us uh, industry government and the community uh, should come together and try to develop the multi stakeholder ecosystem these are the key takeaways uh, which i believe uh, can help the education institutions as well as the corporates uh, as well as the government uh, in order to deliver the best to the students first is a plan and integrated approach to overcome the disruptions indian academic in, uh, institution are required to make a investment in digital tools and uh, because in order to overcome this technological disruptions we have to set up a digital education country kind of thing so that uh, each and every student must have the proper access to the resources or digital resources what i i believe educational uh, institutions should create a repository of uh, libraries and data sources uh, to make the learning method more engaging and effective in the institution need to better collaborate uh, with international universities uh, we have to push uh, uh, the about uh, to uh, we have to push the efforts to uh, for the faculties to get, get engaged uh, in the digital uh, technologies uh, again there is a risk while adopting the while adopting the uh, particular digital platforms there is a risk of uh, getting exposed uh, the privacy can be at a risk so cyber experts are required uh, user friendly training modules to be designed in order to give, uh, to make the f- uh, faculty as well as students uh, uh, learn quickly institutions should may be aware about the copyrights because copyrights when the uh, digital resources are available free uh, freely there are copyrights issues copyright issue may get arised which has to be uh, tackled separately and uh, due to the uh, screen uh, expo- increase in screen exposure the students well being my mental well being can be at a risk so institutions should provide a counseling support to students when they need it overall i at the end i would like to mention the onus is now on us institutions faculty corporates regulators and the government to re- leverage the double edged sword of disruption take the right side step towards creating the first state institutions and strengthen the pillars of india's growth and development thank you any question
Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akit Shah. Is that your name, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I know your uh, your your colleague, uh, Professor Dr. Rajesh. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so yeah, please yeah. Uh, send my regard to him. Uh, well, this is a very comprehensive study of the uh, challenges and the solutions. You covered all aspects of the challenges, including technological, demographic, uh, reputation, uh, regulatory, financial, operational. And you also identified some uh, very uh, comprehensive solutions as well, including uh, uh, changing the long-held beliefs of the learners, uh, and educators shape uh, digital uh, ready uh, institutions, uh, reinvent students' involvement and uh, engaging all stakeholders. That's a very comprehensive uh, view of, uh, of uh, uh, the approach to uh, dealing with the- uh, Thank you, sir. I had tried yeah. to cover maximum five minutes. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. I think uh, we may have uh, a number of questions about your topic because it covers a lot, uh, but also very interesting and useful for us. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. We will. Uh, uh, I, I will share the questions with you. Thank sure, you so sir. much. Let's move on, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All the participants are free to post their questions in the chat box. Okay, so we'll proceed now and I now call out Dr. Sonia Riyath, Uma Bhattacharya and Sim Simran Kumari from Arka Jain University, Jharkhand. Good afternoon. Actually, uh, like my uh, laptop's PC is not enabled to share the screen. So can you just enable it? Ma'am, we have, uh, we have uh, given you the power of presenter, ma'am. So you can uh, share your slide, ma'am. Okay, then I'm sharing this. Is my screen visible to you all? Yes, it is. Uh, just a second. Is it visible to you now? Yes, it yes, is. Ma yes, ma'am. So good afternoon, everyone. I am Uma, student of MBA from Arka Jain University, Jamshedpur, Jharkhand. Today, I will be presenting my research paper titled work from home during COVID-19, a study on work satisfaction amongst the employees in India. So few years back, it was declared by the World Health Organization that COVID, which is emerged in the whole world, is a deadly pandemic and it shall have rigorous effect. So we all coming to the scenario, we all have put an effort to make the study a great experiences in which we will be comparing about the experiences of employees who are working from home so that we will be having a clear picture of what they had to go through when this unexpected pandemic knocked the door. The extended working hours was very stressful because working from home needed a lot of coordination with people to get the work done. So the employees felt less connected to the team and employers faced difficulties in trying to communicate appropriately with their colleagues. This lockdown had changed the mindset of employees towards the culture of working from home. Because we all know earlier people used to took the concept very lightly because when the pandemic arrived, many people used to think that it was all about break, nap, eat, food and shrink. But the myth got broken when they had caught the, all the burdens of work. The lack of communication gave rise to anxiety, self-doubt, hint of depression, and self-esteem issues. So the studies showed that the employees faced the most problem in adapting to the remote environment, obstructing their independence and freedom. The objective of the study is to study the work satisfaction level amongst the employees during work from home system. Second is to compare the work satisfaction level of male and female employees during work from home system. In this study, 
we had used descriptive study because uh, the data which is collected is primary and all the structured questionnaire has been done in the form of Google Sheet. We had used MS Excel and various statistical tools to conduct the study. And uh, by using simple random uh, sampling, the data was collected in the month of May 2021. And we had collected these data from the working person professionals who had worked from home during the pandemic. The sample of our size of our study is 75. And the following hypothesis was made for the study, which is there is no significant difference in the work satisfaction level of male and female employees during the work from home system. The uh, demographic details of the respondent is given below, which stated that there is 59% of our respondents are male and 41% of our respondents are female. 52% of the respondent are there who is below 25 years and 43% of employees are there who is between 25 to 35 years. 5% of respondent is between 35 to 45 years and 64% of uh, uh, people are there who is below 5 years of work experience. 25% of people uh, work, uh, like employees are there who is between 5 to 10 years of experience they are holding and 8% of employees are holding 10 to 5, 15 years of experience and only 3% of employees are holding above 15 years of experience. 12% of uh, candidate respondents are from teaching background and 88% of candidate respondents are from non-teaching corporate. Now, uh, it will be the continued by my co-author Simran. Simran, can you please continue the CPPT? Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Simran, and I shall continue with the uh, analysis and interpretation. The responses received on different aspects from 75 respondents are presented in the form of charts. So with reference to chart one, it is indicated from our observation that about 53.3% resp respondents from the sample taken felt more encouraged when they work from office than home. Next, chart two revealed that 64% of the respondents felt that they are Take, uh, getting the support from their employers. Next, the, the data of chart 3 reflects that 45.3% of the respondents are facing the issue of coordination gap during work from home. Next, uh, chart 4 shows that 36% of the respondents are satisfied with the working hours of work from home. Chart 5 revealed that 37.8% of the respondents do not get normal holidays during the work from home mode. But referring to the uh, responses presented in chart 6, 61.3% of the respondents agree that they work for longer working hours during work from home. Next, we will uh, test, we will know about the testing of hypothesis. So to test the hypothesis, we used F test uh, sample for variance. In this chart, uh, as you can see that F value is uh, greater than F critical value, but the P value is not statistically significant. Therefore, independent sample T test assuming equal variances was conducted. Next, the next chart represent that the T statistics is lesser than T critical value, but P value is insignificant. Therefore, the study fails to reject the null hypothesis. That means there is no significant difference in the work satisfaction level of male and female uh, employees. Now we'll continue with limitations of the uh, study. So since we have got responses from 75 respondents, so the statistical result is based on the responses from this uh, sample. This is our uh, limitations. As we can continue with uh, uh, recommendations, it is therefore recommended that employers should, should implement certain policies to keep the motivation level of employees high and should try to recognize the extra efforts made by the employees by spending extra working hours. The study revealed that the employees are suffering with the issues like coordination gap. Therefore, the higher authorities should try to fill this gap so that the whole team can work without any conflict. I would like to conclude that when the pan pandemic knocked the door, there was a drastic change in the normal work life of the people. They had to change their lifestyle, got introduced to a new concept 
work from home and try to learn digital tools to perform their role online. So uh, next uh, we have the bibliography. This shows our insights and uh, the links that we have got our content from which helped us throughout our uh, research paper. So uh, we would like to thank. Uh, thanks everybody for your uh, presence. Thank you so much. Please any question. If Yeah, thank you very much, Oma and uh, Simran. Uh, that's an interesting uh, topic about um, uh, satisfaction of uh, working from home. Uh, it's interesting to know that uh, there is no significant difference between the male and the female workers uh, with regard to working from home. Um, I think uh, if we conduct that, that uh, study in Cambodia, uh, my assumption is there will be significant difference between uh, male and female because uh, we have we hold different roles. Uh, uh, male uh, uh, are less busy at home than uh, female. So when female work uh, uh, at home, there will be a lot of complications. But uh, I haven't found a study about that yet in Cambodian context. So uh, your study will be very useful for for readers and audience to uh, consider, especially Cambodian people, if they want to uh, study a similar situation. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Heading forward, I now call out Mr. Tushar Ranjan Sahu, Ms. Sandhya Rani Sahu, and Dr. Suraj, Saroj Kumar Sahu, the Sambal Kumar Sahu. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, am I audible? Good afternoon. Please go ahead. Yes, yes ma'am. My screen is visible? Not as of now. Okay. Uh, a very good afternoon to, uh, to all the esteemed uh, chairpersons present in the meeting, in the conference, and all the presenters and all the attendees. So uh, I am Sandhya Rani Sahu, and uh, my co author. Ma'am, the screen is not visible. Is it is it visible, ma'am? No, ma'am. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, now it is. Yes. So sorry for the interruption. Again, uh, uh, a very good afternoon to all the uh, stream chairpersons present in the conference and all the presenters and all the attendees. So. Today we are uh, going to present the paper, the new way of understanding the employee's retention through CRM and performance, a RISM approach. So coming to the introduction part, the relationship establishment and maintenance with uh, the important customers of any service organization is very much important. So the customer relationship management uh, justifies its, its importance for the banking industries mostly. So here the question arises uh, whether there is a uh, whether CRM is having a positive impact or is there any dark side of CRM? So to answer this uh, question, so many uh, factors has been identified and uh, examined by the different authors. So with uh, as per this perspective, the studies research problem has been stated which is uh, that can the employees retention be the end result of branch banking performances and CRM practices of banks in Indian scenario. So based on the uh, based on the research problem, the objectives of the study has been uh, derived that uh, the objective starts with the identifying the major 
determinants of CRM practices that uh, makes it effective to examine the effect of CRM practices and the bank banking performances, to examine the effect of branch making performances and the employees retention in the banking industry, and to examine the effect of CRM practices on employees retention in banking industry. And uh, next one is to establish the rationality of the relationship between the factors such as customer relationship management, branch banking performances and employee retention. And the last objective which was linked to the research problem is to propose some strategies for uh, the banks to take the relationship between the CRM practices, branch banking performances and the employee retention. So the, the next uh, part of the next part of the presentation, the next part of the paper will be presented by my co-author Tushar Anjan Sau. So Tushar, please uh, continue with the presentation. Thank you, madam. Uh, good, good afternoon to all. Is my voice audible? Is my voice audible? Yeah, yes, yes, it's clear. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the study is based on the ISM approach and we did the, some extension of the ISM here to identify the strength of the relationship under the about the variables here. First of all, we find out the relationships of the variables from the literature review as shown here. I find out the different uh, factors from the literature review and their relationships and from the bibliographic data. I found the number of literature found here. Uh, after finding the relationship, I make the self uh, interaction, uh, structural self interaction matrix with the rule that where the B is present, there is relationship between I to J, and where A is present, there is relationship between A to J, and where zero, uh, O is present, there is no relationship, and where X is present, there is relationship, both are in, influencing one another. Uh, this uh, self uh, structural self interaction matrix again I converted into the binary form that is called the initial reachability matrix. Again, this initial reachability matrix converted to the final reachability matrix by the transitivity analysis. And by transitivity analysis, I found three transitivity relationships which are indirectly there have relationship, but from the literature and the, from the expert opinion, we could not find any uh, relationship there. After getting the final reachability matrix, we did the label partitioning. Uh, sorry, uh, we did the uh, find out the uh, driving power of the each and individual variables and the dependency power of the each and individual variables. After finding out the dependency power and driving power, we get to come to the second level uh, by finding the label partitioning. Uh, from the first uh, iteration, we found the bank employee retention as the first level which having the highest dependency power and low driving power and in the second uh, level we found out the bank bank, bank banking performance and the effectiveness of the crm in the bank, bank at the second level and the bank employee prosperity and the uh, consumer's prosperity is the third level and the demographic variable i found that the fourth level by taking these labels, we make a diagram for the graphical representations. And this graphical representation shows that the bank employee retention is dependent by the uh, all of the factors. And whereas the demographic factors are driving you know, power, so he is not uh, depend on anybody and he is driving to all of the factors. And after getting the uh, diagram, we find the relationship strength. Here it is our the uh, here we found the uh, branch uh, bankers uh, prosperity to the branch banking prosperity as the 17 highest literature we found here. And according to that, we make the percentile here. And by this percentile, we make the strength of the relationships in this uh, diagram. Or the this is this diagram we name a new name is that rational interpretive structural modeling. It is our the main contribution to the studies. Uh, before that, so many researches are done that the relationship between the different uh, factors. But here we did a new thing that we find out the relationship. And uh, accordingly, we found that what are the strength of that relationship 
with the expert opinion and the uh, different literatures where we found that. And from this, we found that the bank capital retention is highest uh, dependency power. It is dependent by the uh, bank's bank, bank performance, effective CRM, and customer uh, perspectives and the bank employees perspective. Again, it is also driven by the different uh, demographic factors of the bank employee and the customers. And these are the uh, summary findings which are I described in the figure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. That's a very useful uh, topic that we all should be aware of uh, comparing the uh, satisfaction uh, in, in, in the bank. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Heading forward, I now call out Ms. Garima Chavla and Dr. Silky Vig Kushwa from New Delhi Institute of Management, India, to present their piece. Yeah, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, good afternoon to one and all present here. Uh, I, Karima Chavla, along with my co-author, Dr. Silki Vikush Baha, we have written this research paper on the topic interconnectedness between the stock movements of India and emerging economies during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll start by discussing the motivation behind our study. So the first is interdependency of financial markets leading to heightened risk. With globalization, the financial markets are becoming more and more interdependent. This interdependency also poses a heightened risk of shocks spreading across from one nation to another. Thus, assessing the stock market integration is extremely crucial. Cross-border po uh, portfolio diversification strategies. There's an increasing predilection of investors to invest in financial assets beyond their national boundaries and enrich their portfolios with financial instruments from across the world as global diversification of portfolios allows the investors to mis mitigate the unsystematic risk and increase the potential for higher returns. COVID-19, a period of extreme market fluctuations. The study has been conducted specifically for the pandemic period as it is witnessed in the past uh, crisis that extreme fluctuations do not occur in isolation and that financial shocks experienced in one market are often transferred to another's. Insights on interconnectedness uh, in emerging economies. Our study becomes crucial for investors who wish to get fresh insights into the extent to which stock markets of emerging economies are integrated with each other during the COVID-19 crisis and accordingly they can plan to branch out their investment portfolios. The research objectives are as follows. To examine the correlation among stock markets of emerging economies, analyze the core integration between these markets, understand the existence of short-term or and long-term relationship between these markets, deduce whether diversification among these emerging economies will be beneficial for an investor or not. Data and research methodology. So our study is causal and analytical in nature, and the study includes the stock market indices of the top 10 emerging economies. And the sample element includes, includes the daily closing price data of all elements from January 2019 to September 2021, and the data has been retrieved from investing.com. So in our study, the dependent variable is the stock market of India, which is Sensex, and the others are taken as the independent variables. So this is the methodology that has been followed to uh, deduce the results. In the first step, we have conducted the Jacobita test to check the normality of our data series. Then we have used the Pearson correlation test to understand the degree of correlation between the stock market indices. Then we have uh, uh, to check the presence of unit root, we have conducted the augmented Dickey Fuller test. Then we have used the Johnson co integration check to check the co integration between the time series. And finally, uh, the choice of VAR or Wecker model to infer the long term or short term causal relationship between the time series. So uh, as uh, Johnson co-integration test was conducted, 
because uh, the time series uh, was stationary at the first order of integration and hence there was a need to check the co-integration. So we have used the Johnson co-integration test and uh, the results we got accepted the null hypothesis. In other words, no co-integration exists between the variables of the study. So uh, when there exists a co-integration between two variables, we estimate the Wacom model. And if there isn't a, any co-integration relationship, we estimate the VAR model. So now as per our results of the co-integration test, the VAR model was the best fit to analyze the nexus between the price moments of the Indian stock market and the emerging markets. So uh, results of uh, VAR uh, show that the, there was a positive impact of lagged values of stock prices of India Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and South Africa on the values of the Indian stock market. Moreover, the study confirmed that there is no influence of China, Indonesia, Poland, South Korea, and Turkey's stock price movements on the price movements of India. So our study has examined the co-integration of India with emerging economies, which has unleashed new prospects for investors to invest internationally in markets that show no premonitions of co-integration. The results have corroborated that the Indian market is not co-integrated with China, Indonesia, Poland, South Korea, and Turkey stock market during the COVID-19 period. The findings infer that investors from these markets can invest in the financial markets of these countries for the purpose of portfolio diversification. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please proceed. Thank you. Coming up next, we have Mr. Sayantan Chakrabarti, Dr. Silki Vig Kushwaha from New Delhi Institute of Management, India. Thank you. Thank you, Visible. Yes, sir. So, good evening to one and all present here. Uh, I am Shantan Chakraborty uh, from New Delhi Institute of Management. So, me along with my co-author, Dr. Silke Vik Kushwa, have written this uh, paper on the interrelationship between the commodity market and stock market during COVID-19 pandemic. And now I'll be giving a presentation on that. Talking of the motivation of the study. The first one is the, that the steel uh, in India's economic development. Steel is now becoming one of the most um, indispensable components for, the, uh, for a developing and emerging economy like India. The consumption of steel in India is expected to rise due to the booming industries, automobile and railway sectors. Next one is its contribution to the GDP. The Indian steel business grows through export and it adds to the GDP of India. The consequence is a huge domestic and foreign investment, which is seen in the steel and the allied sectors. The next factor is the Chinese factor. China accounts for more than 76% of steel manufacturing and exports. Any move by China impacts India's steel sector returns, and China began to hurt the export of iron ore previous years uh, during the month of uh, May when this study was conducted. So, uh, talking about the literature review, uh, there were studies which showed the interdependence of uh, various other commodities such as oil, uh, gold, um, etc. But there were no studies on the commodity steel or iron ore. So, before doing this study, we studied some research papers on uh, those other commodities. Coming to the research uh, objective, these are our two research objectives. The first one is the, that the study shows the impact of share prices of all the steel companies and nifty metal on iron ore. And the second one is the study shows uh, also shows that the impact of iron ore and share prices of all the steel companies on nifty metal index. Uh, the study is uh, causal and analytical in nature. And uh, these are the variables that we used in our study. Uh, the independent variables are uh, the uh, stock prices of the, all these uh, steel companies and uh, dependent variables. 
and the dependent variable is uh, in one case it's it is iron ore and in the next case it is uh, nifty metal index the daily closing prices of all the study variables were taken uh, the data for nifty metal index and stock returns of all the steel companies have been extracted from the website of uh, national stock exchange that is nsc and the data for daily uh, iron ore prices have been extracted from the website of investing these are the two uh, equations that we studied the in the first case uh, iron ore is the, the dependent variable and in the second case nifty metal is the dependent variable this is the metal methodology followed uh, first we check the normality then we check for stationarity after that we check the co-integration test using the johnson's co-integration test and after that we used the var or wickham model now comes the test, test for stationarity the relationship between stationarity and regression. It is important to uh, understand that in the case of non-stationary series, the findings and inferences from the regression are not correct and hence useless. Thus, the stationarity of the time series data has been examined. The second one is the augmented Dickey Fuller test. The test to test whether the data are stationary or not, augmented Dickey Fuller test has been applied on the time series data. Results of the ADF test, the result suggests that uh, all the study variables have a unit root and at level and are not stationary. After transforming them to the first difference level, all the variables get converted into a stationary data. These are the results. As we can see, uh, at level, it was not stationary and after making the first difference, it became a stationary. Now the co-integration test. Need for co-integration test. Time series, uh, time series are stationary at the first order of integration, and hence there arises a need to investigate co-integration. Johnson's co-integration test. The study uses the Johnson's co-integration test to examine the co-integration, and uh, the results obtained does not reject the null hypothesis. The results confirm that none of the variables are co-integrated, as shown in the table. Uh, here we can see that the none of the variables uh, in in, uh, in my data is co-integrated, and uh, thus the var model suits the suits the best in best in this case. The var results. The study shows that neither metal index price uh, nor iron ore price substantially influence each other. The findings also reveal that the iron ore is impacted only by its previous lag, and the Nifty Metal Index is also impacted by its own lag values and not by the prices of steel companies and iron ore. The two conclusions that we uh, found after this study are, the first one is uh, there is no significant impact uh, on each other. The empirical evidence of the study highlights that neither the metal index price uh, nor the iron ore price have a significant impact on each other. The results also show that uh, the iron ore is only affected by its previous lag. Similarly, the Nifty Metal Index is influenced by its own lag values rather than the steel and iron ore prices. The second point is portfolio diversification. There is no interrelationship between iron ore and Nifty Metal Index, which will impact portfolio diversification of the investors. The results are beneficial to domestic and foreign investors as they invest as they can invest in the commodity market that is in iron ore and the equity market simultaneously as both are independent of each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's proceed. Thank you. Coming up next, we have Dr. Latha K. and Mr. Ashwin Cherian Matthew from St. Kitts College of Engineering, Kerala. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am, ma you are audible. Yes, ma'am, ma I don't have that access to share my PPT. Can you please enable me?
in fact i have joined to two devices can... ma'am one is my laptop and the other one is my mobile so can you please enable my laptop because i'm coming here you have been given the madam you have been given the privilege of presenter you can share the ppt oh but then when i click this share option i am getting the message only meeting organizers and presenters can share ma'am that is a message i am getting uh, dr rika i think you have given the another one uh, permission because she has joined from two yes, devices sir. yes i have given so you need to give permission for two devices Okay, so can I ask my co-author Ashwin to share the slides? Ashwin, are you there? All right, ma'am. I have already shared my slides to you. Is it possible yes. for you to share it? Okay, ma'am. I've given you. I'll give. I've given you the privilege for both the. Uh, yes, yes, time. yes. Now it is. Now, now it is. Now it is possible, ma'am. Just a minute. I'm thank here. you. Thank yes, you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So. Honorable Chairperson of this session, dignitaries, and my co-presenters, a warm good afternoon to one and all present here. I am grateful to all of you for giving me an opportunity to present at the IMCON 2022 on building resilience the way forward. I'm Dr. Leda, Associate Professor at St. Gilles College of Engineering, Kerala, and I have uh, my co-author, Mr. Ashwin Chiri and Mathi, with me. So this is one thing we are concentrating through this study. We have, we have focused on reconfiguration strategy for management education in India in the context of challenges and opportunities. This is my agenda of presentation, introduction, objectives, originality, research methodology, descriptive statistics, data analysis, findings and conclusions. So as we all know, India is uh, India is one of the best in the case of higher education sector in the, in the sense like it is the largest one. But still, as far as the gross enrollment ratio factor is concerned, India is just having 26.3 percentage compared to overall uh, world average of 24 percentage. Also, uh, when we come across this particular uh, percentage, it is very low compared to other countries like South Korea, wherein we have got 94 percentage of enrollment ratio, while China has got 51 percentage. That is a current scenario. Now, with respect to uh, you know current situation, especially COVID pandemic situation, actually have put students in tr big trouble because most of the students were not in a position to access education during the time. So at that time, online education, especially massive online open courses, were there emerged as a blessing in disguise. So that is the context of our study. Now, at present, when we consider the online platform or also online learning, India is the second largest market uh, for e-learning. Uh, USA is the first one in this context. So, this is the context of our study, wherein we will be discussing technological implementations in the higher education sector of India. This is what exactly. Also, we have uh, uh, noticed the rise of hybrid learning in our higher education sector. So, our study focuses mainly on three things. First one being analyze the opportunities and challenges of online learning in higher education sector. Also to explore the perspective of students on student intrinsic motivation and choosing a successful teacher of open online courses, especially MOOC courses. And also to identify the strategies to be adopted by the online course providers to improve the attractiveness of it. So these are the three major aspects of our study. Now, our study is a uh, little original or else uh, what is the exact value of the study means, you know, we have concentrated more on how this online education system can be rebuilt or what is the reconfiguration strategy. So what all steps are to be initiated by the government or else by the organizers. So in this context, we have taken uh, the conceptual model, especially the academic uh, part of this particular, uh, you know, online education is taken. So we have explored the academic motivation theory as well as 5C framework model of Kelly School of Business. So these are the uh, theoretical concepts we have concentrated in which we have taken commitment, challenge, competition, contemporaneous aspects, as well as when we come across success, selection of successful online teacher and academic success, again, charisma of the person or those who are taking the session, competence of the faculty members, compensation factor as well as contribution okay so these are the four factors in this context 
Now we have followed a methodology wherein descriptive research design is used. Also, the study is conducted among 60, 631 students of B schools of four southern states of India. And uh, we have uh, followed a purposive sampling method and uh, we have followed five point Likert scale. But then the entire study is concentrated on this 5C model. Now, to test the impact of our independent variable on dependent variable, we have gone through correlation analysis, regression analysis, etc. And then impact of various factors on student engagement in massive open online courses are also studied. So let's move through our model in which I have come out with all the factors we have taken into consideration. So here we can see that student involvement in online courses, that is one dependent variable. And then we have taken all the uh, factors like commitment, challenge, contemporaneous of the course, com competition, control, charisma, competency, contribution, compensation, and consultancy. So this multiple regression model is developed as written here. Now, regression analysis says that that is adjusted asker value says that 45.3 percentage that is what uh, dependent variable that is the variance that is the percentage uh, you know variance explained by the independent variables and also with respect to this our r square value we can say that uh, this particular uh, 45 47.5 percentage adjusted r square value can be considered like a moderate model so it's a moderate model to explain the variation in the dependent variable with respect to the selected independent variables also, significance value is obtained as 0 0.00 at uh, degree, uh, degree of freedom of 3. Now, the major findings of our study, that is, ma majority of the respondents are of the opinion that these online courses, especially massive online open courses, are a way by which they can build new skills. Because there is always a kind of cry from corporate world telling there is a lack of skill set with respect to the the. Uh, actual requirement. Also, that is the reason by which Tata as well as Maruti, all these companies are going for some kind of uh, online, that is, they are asking their potential employees to undergo some online courses followed by factory kind of training. So this is one option by which we can fill, we can, you know, build that gap between what industry demands and what our educational system is providing to our students. And second major observation is that participation and successful competition of these courses actually requires a relatively high level of intrinsic motivation. So that is one thing, one factor by which we can see the success rate of open online courses. Also, third fact is like, uh, you know, more, more courses also falls in the age group of 20 to 24. So that is, uh, you know, this particular category of students also plays a major role. And then with respect to our 5C framework to drive students' intrinsic motivation, all the five factors are uh, actually contributing to ways this particular engagement uh, pro engagement of students in various more courses. Um, we can see that commitment first factor in which uh, we can say that uh, uh, when students are sitting together for a course, especially a group, a feeling of being a large group. So if it is better to come out with the listing of all the participants, that is one point says. Second strategy being, you know, the challenges, challenges factor because uh, the students can overcome the problem of online courses because uh, the usage of learning diagnostics, because there is a different students have got different pace of learning. So online courses actually help them to adjust with their pace. That is another kind of strategy. Also regarding the control mechanism, people uh, or students, most of the participants prefer asynchronous MOOCs with the facilities of more control of participants over their environment. Or they don't prefer synchronous, synchronous moves at all. Then with respect to competition, since these kind of courses are facilitating some kind of uh, assignments as well as some kind of challenges for the students, there is a healthy competition between these participants. And also we have to come out with the pre-recorded lectures as well as make it more convenient. Contemporaneous has to be taken into consideration. Now with respect to the second aspect of IC framework of uh, choosing a successful online teacher, again, charisma of the the faculty plays a major role, as well as competency, especially with respect to senior faculties are more preferred for an online course than uh, beginners. Also, content, uh, constancy must be there. Compensation. Compensation factor is one factor wherein most of our respondents were neutral to the particular concept of paying an extra fee for a faculty for you know providing online courses. And then about contribution, uh, most of the participants of the survey knew that they're providing, they're providing the key faculty with the supporting staff. So instead of just giving one particular faculty for a course, it's better to have a supporting faculty so that 
sessions will be more interesting as well as it will be more you know less tiresome these are the strategies so to conclude our study we can say that uh, a list of names of students who are currently undergoing a course can be displayed so that it will create a kind of feeling among the students that we are also a part of a large group that's one strategy also as i have already mentioned key faculty with a supporting faculty in the online course will definitely will, will make the session more interesting also uh, another drawback in this context is like you know most of the students they are going for uh, college classes because they want to have real life experience as well as they want to enlarge their social network so that is a main drawback of this system that is especially with respect to new courses and also another thing is that uh, we have got lot of challenges with respect to online education like illegal downloading of our content violation of licensing norms illegal file sharing etc so there should be some sort of cyber security or some sort of uh, private networks to be provided so that this this kind of issues can be tackled so that's all from my side within this 5 minutes thank you so much sir for the opportunity thank you very much uh, please proceed thank you ma'am thank you heading forward heading forward we have mr petros abi from mizan tepi university ethiopia we shall proceed and i now call out dr mohammad altaf khan and mr amulya kumar sahu from jamia millia islamia and shyama prasad mukherjee college delhi university yes sir uh, good afternoon to everybody am i audible yes sir you are audible sir just a second uh my ppt is visible to everybody no no sir it's not visible but i am sharing here uh... sir you you have been given all the power sir all the presentation power. kindly share and take up one now it is visible no sir no sir yes now it is is it visible yes sir okay thank you uh, myself amulya kumar sahu and uh, my uh, research uh, guide is dr altaf khan uh, we are uh, oh. presenting the paper uh, the marine economy of odisha is a road to prosperity i think that ki it is the most uh, sector that is neglected so far because it is the great uh, ample to, uh, opportunity to interrupt you sir uh, sorry to interrupt sorry. you sir in your ppt is not visible sir it's just the screen is showing white screen sir just a second now no sir no, sir uh, some just a second just a second so some problem is So is it visible to everybody? No. 
my topic is the marine economy of Odisha. It is uh, the ample opportunity which has create, which should be created uh, more employment opportunities and foreign exchange reserves. In this uh, study, uh, <coughs> we want to focus that key how the marine eco Odisha is has a greatest opportunities and is just neglected so far. It has uh, you know um, as uh, it is a coastal states and uh, marine products like fish and prawn is there and. Uh, it is the contributing uh, around 9.70 lakh tons, uh, metric tons, uh, to the export, and still, uh, still um, around 2% uh, total exports to the all over the export sector of Odisha. So, in this, with the objective, major objectives of the studies are the present status and trends of Odisha marine products export, then how the uh, composition and direction of the Odisha marine egg product has changed uh, from time to time. Then, want to study the growth and instability in the major marine products of export. Okay. Wrong. Then, okay. sir, 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 ma'am. No, no, no. uh, then, the major uh, methodology we have used is compound annual growth rate, instability index, and uh, Markovchev chain method to uh, stab, establish the uh, market opportunity is a matrix which is used to uh, evaluate how the market share has changed for the export of the marine products from time to time. Okay, so <clears throat> the next we found that around uh, the total amount, uh, the if you are in the value terms around. Uh, 29, 10 to 19% in 2019, which has increased to 34.59% of total marine exports is exported to uh, foreign countries from Odisha. Uh, then the, we have also trained the, how the annual growth of marine fish productions and how the instability instability due to market fluctuation, due to change in exchange rate, due to change in the consumption pattern, how the production as well as export has changed from time to time through instability, that is uh, cobbler's in, uh, instability index. <clears throat> we found that uh, as a total from 2009 to the data, 2009 to 2019, the uh, instability index is higher, around 60% instability, out of which the shrimp, marine shrimp is 47%, cultural shrimp is 87.56 instability. And this instability is maybe due to foreign exchange rates, due to the change in the consumption pattern, due to foreign trade policies. So we have not given the details, but mostly the trade policies and the consumption pattern, that is the major factor uh, by which that creates more instability in the production as well as export of the marine fish product. Then on district wise, there are uh, seven districts, including Khurda. Though Khurda is not the coastal districts, but Chilka is the part of Khurda. So we take the Khurda district for the analyzing the uh, annual growth as well as the contribution of uh, marine products district wise. So we found that from uh, time period from 2009 to 2019, the production of the chilka, marine production of the chilka is increasing, whereas other districts like Puri, Baleswar, Ganjam is decreasing. Why? Because the marine prawn and marine crab is more demanding in international market as compared to other marine fish. So as chilka is the sole 
uh, so, so production of uh, marine crab is huge amount of marine crab and marine fish, marine prawns is produced and exported from Chilka. This is the major reason why the Chilka production is increasing and export also increasing. <coughs> then uh, on district wise, we found that, uh, sorry, on export wise, when we comparing to as compared to in India in 2009-10, uh, whereas in India's uh, export con constitute only 3.52% of marine products, in Odisha is just 1.19 production. Whereas it has increased in, in, in Indian case, it has increased to 5.85, around double. Uh, but though Odisha's exports of marine product as a, as a share of total exports has increased from 1.19 to 2.01, but the growth of exports of Indian marine products is higher than the growth of uh, Indian, uh, sorry, Odisha's marine products. So uh, it is not, uh, many, uh, it, it is not eye-catching that it is growing more. There are so many ample opportunities which can be explored to increase the exports of marine products from Odisha to other states as well as other foreign countries. Then we want to uh, show that. I'm sorry, also, Mr. Petros, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you please uh, move on to your conclusion as uh, uh, you have been uh, using? Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, okay, the last, sir. last, sir. Okay. So uh, the one, uh, two conclusion how the direction has changed from uh, the European countries to the East Asian countries. Now the exports, the growth of exports of marine products is towards. Uh, mostly Asian countries as compared to the Western uh, European countries as well as USA. Uh, the conclusion is that uh, now government of India as well as government of Odisha is now focusing the marine products. So there are so many policies has introduced recently basically Pradhan Mantri Mascha Sajan Jajana which has focused on the second blue revolution after uh, allocating around 20,000 crores uh, in the budget for the 2020 fo solemnly focus on the blue revolution of the marine products. And what are the major loopholes? Why Odisha has not uh, catch the uh, top level as compared to other states like Goa, Kerala and uh, Maharashtra? The major problem is one that is infrastructure development. Due to lack of space ability at sea and airport, and there is lack of warehousing. So that is the reason why the export sector has not increasing. Second, there is no branding and marketing of median products of Odisha specifically. There is no any brand or any marketing. Then another problem is that we are not allowed the local seaport till see still Paradip, which is the major port which is exporting the iron ore, still not. Uh, allowing to export the marine products. We have to follow up the uh, Vishapatnam airport, sorry, Vishapatnam seaport for the exporting of the marine products. And last, we are we should have to focus morely on the Asian markets uh, that like Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia for the marine products which can be exported from Odisha to these countries. Thank you very much, Thanks, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Calling out next, Ms. Purnima Lingam from SRMIST University of Management, Chennai. Moving forward, I call out Dr. Rulimi Das, School of Management Sciences, Department of Business Administration, Tezpur University. We shall move forward. And I now call out Ms. Apurva Singh and Dr. Neeti Rana from Gautam Buddha University, Noida. Uh, thank you for calling me. Myself, uh, just a minute, let me share the screen first.
is my screen visible yes ma'am okay uh, good afternoon everyone uh, i am apurva singh from uh, a research scholar from gbu gautam buddha university in uh, greater noida and i am doing my research under dr uh, niti rana and here i am presenting my paper that is role of kaizen events in motivating employees and increasing their productivity and resilience uh some of the content which i will be presenting in this presentation will be abstract introduction literature review objective methodology benefits and purpose of kaizen events finding and conclusions this is my abstract which i have already given for the paper now i would like to start with the introduction part uh if i talk about kaizen so i would like to start with the uh, us uh, a definition given by or a uh, line given by mr masaki imai the father of kaizen uh, kaizen who is known as the father of kaizen the message of kaizen strategy is that not a day should go by without some kind of improvement being made somewhere in the company so he talks uh, about kaizen that uh, there should be always some improvement a day no day should be go uh, without making any improvement uh in even in our personal life or in even our in our daily day, life we should make some improvement so that we can make the things better since uh, just now which, uh, i have told uh, that is Fa masaki mai is known as the father of kaizen and he introduced this term by his book the key to japanese competitive success in 1986 and this uh, book this term he gave uh, it come into existence or we can say that it was introduced in after second world war and uh, and uh, when Jap this uh, japanese country uh, co companies use this term for the improvement in their uh, organizations uh, when we talk about kaizen so it is compound word of two uh, concepts uh, that is kai and zen kai where kai means change and zen means for betterment and when it is converted into an english term it is known as continuous improvement so uh continuing to the uh, introduction uh initially it was used to make improvement and uh, reduce defects in the process of production and manufacturing but now it is being used in each and every sector even uh, uh, in uh, human resource also even in uh, um, hospital saving in pharmaceuticals companies in other companies also and uh, since just now west were i uh, it uh, said that is it is being used in personal lives also human life also social life and work life also when applied the uh, to the workplace kaizen means continuous improvement involving everyone from manager to workers so we are talking about that whenever we are uh, organizing any kaizen event we are trying to uh, engage every person of the organization it can be the higher person that is top level, level management and even the worker also because uh, in kaizen we talk about various ideas generation various um, uh, we talk about uh, some Uh, points which can make a uh, uh, small uh, improvements which we can give us a good improvement to the organization when we talk about resilience in employees so it is it means we, when we are increasing their attention towards the organization so that they can uh, give uh, better outcome better productivity so that the organization can also grow better when we talk about kaizen events so kaizen event is designed to support an effective short term brainstorming session that focuses on single challenges and improve an existing process it uh, kaizen event can be of 3 to 5 days or it may last to only 5 to 6 days for the same uh, since it's a review paper so i have gone through few uh, research papers and some published and unpublished data for the same i have gone through around 36 review paper uh, sorry research papers which is from the year 2008 to two, uh, uh, year 2022 so uh, this is what is i have uh, make a five years compiled uh, literature review part uh, should i read this literature review Uh, Dr. Uh, Apuva, uh, because you yes, only have five yes. minutes, can you please move on to your questions yeah. and uh, findings? Okay. okay, sir. 
okay thank you sir so uh, this is these are my objectives for the same that is uh, to assess the kaizen even position in motivating an employees and increasing their productiveness and resilience how kaizen approach works in different activities and at different places and different levels how it can be helpful in the human resource policies and activities in different sectors such as manufacturing non manufacturing service industries etc to understand about the other distinct gears and strategies which are related to kaizen techniques so other kaizen techniques which are related to these uh, some some of the type kaizen techniques are that is a uh, lean six sigma 5s these are some of the other kaizen techniques also uh, uh, for the methodology i have uh, done a holistic study of research paper as i have told 36 around papers i have uh, read and also gone through some published and unpublished data after that i was able to analyze what are the benefits of kaizen uh, in other industries also or we can say that in what may be the role of kaizen in motivating employees and product increasing their productivity and then purpose of events and uh, for for the on the same behalf i was able to draw a conceptual framework model these are the benefits to develop problem solving culture to identify value stream application in various sectors to reduce defects and improve operations increase customer satisfaction motivates employees increase employee satisfaction employee retention and employee and organization resilience uh the purpose of kaizen event since kaizen event may will be successful only when uh, uh we are able to motivate and engage employees to improve the quality and productivity so if we should inspire our personnel for innovation and creativity through focused improvement bringing cost effectiveness do, uh, through loss reduction uh, product quality and productivity improvement leading to basic enhancement in organizational competitiveness and customer satisfaction encourage team building and organization activities to provide a possibility of for our employees to earn extra it will also help in employee resilience and organizational resilience so this is the conceptual model which i was able to draw after a lit my literature review holistic study that is uh, to involve our uh, employees in kaizen even it is very important to train them and to make uh, to make them understand what is kaizen and how it works since it's not a uh, Uh, a technique or a, a strategy which is to be uh, which is to be uh, learned it any unskilled labor can work on it so we just need to train them it is an easy term to understand that and then uh, because of training we will be able to uh, engage our employees we will be able to motivate our employees and it will also lead to job satisfaction and finally when the employees are engaged in uh, activities uh, they if they are feel they feel motivated they are satisfied with their job uh, ultimately the result will be better employee performance and employee resilience which i have just given in my findings that is final outcome will be when uh, we are able to improve, uh, motivate our employees and uh, engage them in job satisfaction the final outcome will be better employee performance and resilience few of the examples uh, which i have uh, given in my paper also that is with the companies renowned named companies which are using kaizen for uh, to motivate their employees or to engage their employees in uh, making things uh, uh, better or to make the continuous improvement for the organization that is lockheed martin this is an aerospace company which is uh, using kaizen just to uh, uh, using kaizen to le lessen the manufacturing expenses or delivery time and to uh, give satisfaction to the uh, Apura, customers I'm sorry dr apuba perhaps yes, uh, yes, you sir. can share these uh, examples to uh, to us and then we we'll explore by ourselves uh, thank okay. you so much okay, for your presentation uh, so the time is up already so thank you okay. thank you so much thank you thank you sir thank you thank okay. you yeah let's move on Thank you. I request the participants to post their questions on the chat box. Moving forward, I now call out Mr. Shams Tabriz Kadri and Dr. Shubhajit Pahari from Brainware University, Kolkata. Heading forward. we have mr rahul kumar and dr neeraj kumari from manav rashna international institute of research and studies faridabad hello ma'am uh, 
Am I audible? Yes, you are. So you can proceed with presentation. Is my PPT is visible? Yes. Ma'am, my PPT is visible and I am audible. Yes, yes. Okay, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, my name is Rahul Kumar. Uh, I am research scholar of Manu Rasna International Institute of Research and Study, Faridabad. Uh, this paper, uh, my co author, uh, ma'am, is uh, Dr. Neeraj Kumari, who is my um, research guide. My paper title is Effect of Welfare Facilities on Employee Performance in the Higher Educational Institutions. Uh, I am going to start my uh, uh, presentation uh, with the definition of welfare facility. All those facilities which can improve employees' comfort, morale, motivation, and fulfill social, physiological security need beyond the wages paid and are called welfare facilities. We all know about the welfare facilities. Um, that is, for example, drinking water, crutches, uh, canteen, leave, travel facility, etc. My paper is actually my paper is uh, uh, focus on uh, welfare facilities impact of welfare facilities on employee performance this is a review paper in which i take i took uh, 28 re, uh, liter, re, research paper in my uh, review paper next uh, is employee performance um, in, employee performance is a dynamic process continuous process to determine how an employee does their job efficiently within a limited time period and um, they do their job uh, with uh, quality of work uh, which is given by the organization and this is called employee performance next is literature review i have uh, already taken a 28 literature review in my research paper uh, but here i uh, mention only recent uh, literature review of 2020 20 uh, nirmala selvan uh, kamau margana uh, mumbai and uh, next uh, anita lucky this is this review, uh, I have taken all in my PPT only four review paper because of because of uh, shortage of time period. This is my objective. Uh, my objective is to study the effect of welfare facilities or employee performance in the higher education institutions, and uh, two suggestion and recommendation about um, you know, welfare facility, which welfare facility is enhancing employee performance in the higher education institutions. This is my research methodology process and this is my research framework. I, uh, I use the qualitative research technique to explore the role of welfare facility on employee performance in the higher education institution. My study is based on the secondary data, uh, like uh, already I told, uh, uh, like various journal, uh, journals, magazine, books, and thesis. Uh, the, my research framework is uh, as an independent variable item taken. I was uh, taken uh, welfare facility as independent variables and uh, employee performance as dependent variables. And after uh, review all the re all the research paper of various researchers, I found that the every higher education institutions provide employee welfare facility across the globe, across, across the world, and uh, the. Employee uh, welfare facilities uh, have significant and positive impact on uh, employee performance as well as employee satisfaction. Uh, almost all well, all organized higher education in institutions provide welfare facility to increase employee morale, motivation, and honesty toward the organization. Welfare facilities should be provided as per the requirement whenever it is needed and each and every term intervals. Every higher education institution as well as government has the responsibility to measure the monitor and the outcomes of the welfare facilities. According to me, uh, after after completed my uh, review paper, I thought um, I was thinking that without welfare facility, employee motivation, employee satisfaction, and uh, enhancement of employee motivation and employee satisfaction is not possible. That's all from, from my side. This is uh, the references, and uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Let's proceed. Thank you. 
I now call out Mr. Shams Tabriz Kadri and Dr. Shubhajit Pahari from Brainware University, Kolkata. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, am, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. And respected teachers, uh, our faculty member, and all dignitaries who is presented here, uh, I am Tabriz Kadri. Uh, my screen is visible. Sorry, but your screen is not visible. Yes, now it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my screen is visible? Yes, your screen is visible, but your presentation yeah, yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, I am uh, Ms. Kadri. I am a research scholar of Brainwave University, Calcutta. Uh, actually, I am presenting my paper along with my guide. My guide is Dr. Savati Pahari. He is an assistant professor of management. University of Calcutta. And my paper title is A uh, Study of Consumer Perception of Tax and Investments During pandemic, pandemic Times with Reference to Southern Region of Calcutta. And my presentation outline first is that introduction and second, uh, objective of the study, a literature review, methodology of the study, impact of COVID 19 on, on business, that selling strategy during the pandemic times, and conclusion last year. So, uh, as far as my uh, paper is concerned, I'm just uh, uh, giving my introduction. Uh, Sorry to interrupt can... you, but your yeah. presentation is not visible to us. Ma'am, is it visible, ma'am? Ma'am, is it visible? No, it isn't. Actually, ma'am, just the right now in Google premises. Uh, so that's why I'm just finding the, some technical problem. Eh? That's why. And my voice is audible. Your voice is audible, your screen is visible, but your presentation is not visible. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a second, ma'am. Just a second. Sure. Ma'am, visible, ma'am? No. Ma'am, actually, uh, can I uh, proceed? I'm just looking at slide, yes, can. can I proceed, ma'am? Yes. Yes, yes, can. Uh, yes, ma'am. Please give me permission. Proceed. Hello? Yes, sir. It can proceed, but yeah, yeah. PPT is not. And can I send my PPT now? Uh, Mr. Tabrez is fine. You can, you can, uh, and sharing the screen, you can present directly. I mean, okay, okay. Sure, go sure. on with the presentation. Sure. Okay. Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, close yeah. your, and, you can okay, close okay, your okay, screen. Sure. Thanks, thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. So actually, uh, just I am coming my first topic. Uh, just I am giving my introduction. Uh, COVID-19 okay. on first and had a wide influence on this. Most notably, the entire blog of the country, which is proud, social, and financial. A world that is always buzzing with activity has become silent and timid. Has been averted, deal with, and never declared such calamity. The coronavirus has had a uh, sectoral impact, as the country's whole diet selling industry has suffered. And that diet selling industry has a low cost profit in business activity that allows to earn commission on health care. Uh, it's my objective. Uh, my objective of the study to measure the effectiveness of the existing strategy used in that selling business and uh, to propose some new strategies that selling using latest technologies keeping in mind the pandemic situation. Uh, my literature review, uh, I'm just uh, capturing uh, the literature review. COVID 19's effect on that selling has piqued the interest of many academic, uh, ac academics, practitioners, and bloggers from all over the world. According to Jabil, due to the lack of vaccination, rapid geographical dissemination and particular diagnostic phase he says of course that's the more studied reaction and professionally marketed arrangement with COVID-19 to be met and uh, uh, generic uh, believes that the only way to prevent the coronavirus from spreading the whole levels of society according to Barua, the novel mm -hmm. coronavirus has impacted in impacted the both uh, big and small businesses perception, perception is uh, psychologically linked uh, to the pattern of expectations and has an Im uh, immense impact on whether distributors can fit or stay in the diet selling industry. The cognition process that driver consumer perceptions are described by the CAB paradigm. A methodology of the study, uh, the input data are collected from the various diet selling companies, that is Amway, Hermalife, Oriflame, MyLife, uh, and Vestis, uh, through discussion and in interviews. Conduct during the month of November, December uh, 2021. Some input data are also collected from the existing literature. Uh, in addition, some conceptual 
input data are added to the study based on my experience in hello 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 yes sir your your audio yeah. sir yeah yeah okay okay thank you ma'am thank you ma'am Uh, so i am just uh, giving my impact uh, of the covid 19 business present at the present time corona virus corona virus is still circulating widely across the globe with no clear end in sight we are doing our part as a responsible citizen by adhering to social distance curfew a world that is still buzz, buzzing with activity has uh, gone silent and all human resources have been diverted to place to uh, yeah never before since the crisis uh, here are the Some companies' data. I'm very Herbalife, Avon, and uh, some Medal Honga, no, Nostal, and just uh, uh, diet selling study during the pandemic times. I'm just narrating, ready to move back office uh, in the uh, uh, COVID times. Uh, during the COVID times, COVID-19 exposed a slew and issues that is affecting havoc on the organized organization. Move product online. It is true that diet selling company products are transferring online in the uh, midst of the pandemic lockdown and strictness. According to Forbes magazine, the CEO of one, uh, two, three internet companies, Scott Jones, has witnessed an increase in organization wanted to construct website or home-based ones. The focus of e-commerce trend and channel improving the sales tactics during the COVID-19 crisis. The majority of Mr. Tanda, sorry to interrupt. You can come to your conclusion. Okay, okay, sure, 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 sure. The COVID-19 has had a huge impact on people's life, the economy, and the direct selling industry all over the uh, globe, all over the nation. And advertisers must uh, adjust to these new realities. The pandemic uh, uh, situation presents great opportunity for direct selling business, direct selling companies to sustain their platforms distinctly across crisis and, in the long run, um, catalyze a new era of direct selling growth. In this article, we look. it how the pandemic affected and reset new ideas for that selling company digital meetings to prepare for the that selling markets digital transition we encourage that selling to business to create new creative selling ideas future research uh, could look into the effect of expanding the uh, direct selling business a digital trend on new product launch that selling training and conduct business seminar here is the my reference thank you sir Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's proceed. Thank you. Next presenter for the day is Ms. Sonakshi Verma from Gautam Buddha University, Greater Noida. So now you need to unmute yourself. No, you are not audible. We cannot hear you.
we proceed to the next participant i now call out ms akankika tripathi from rajshri university balangi uh, thank you so much a very good afternoon very good evening to eminent dignitaries resource scholar and one and all present over here um okay let me share my ppt first Ma'am, you are not audible to us. Now I am audible. Yes. And I request you to make it um, a little quick, as we are running short of time. um my uh, the title of my paper is impact of covid 19 on growth of mobile banking in india uh, moving forward to introduction uh, technology innovation has now become a strategic imperative that is vital part of development of any sector and like any other sector banking sector has also absorbed the need for innovative technical initiative in banking service by seeing the potential of internet and technology india plan for cashless digital economy with two main weapon that is internet and mobile phones and which leads to banking service with handheld device called mobile banking a dramatic growth has been seen in mobile banking over the year but Uh, the pandemic of covid-19 has become a um, great contributor to the to the growth of mobile banking during covid-19 mobile banking became a means for people to make obligatory and regular payments transfer and other transaction uh, with a click of a button so this research is motivated after observing the drastic change in pattern of digital payment during and after lockdown after conducting a brief literature review i came across a number of paper about the growth of mobile banking over the years and factor responsible for it but the global pandemic has played a major role towards the growth and factors contributing to the growth has been changed which is the basic motive of this paper to study the growth and its future effect the research objective of this papers are uh, to understand the growth in mobile banking over the years to identify whether covid-19 result in growth of mobile banking transaction in india to study contribution of mobile banking for maintaining social distancing and to understand the future of mobile banking in india the hypothesis of the research is uh, covid-19 did not result in the growth of mobile banking in india methodology it is basically an exploratory research and conducted on the basis of secondary data collected from various resources like rbi reports journals newspapers the basic findings uh, the key findings of my studies are people subject from interactive cash transaction to mobile banking transaction very rapidly and demonetization in digital india plans accelerate this growth uh, although um, it was growing rapidly but lockdown period caused a steady monthly growth in mobile banking transaction during covid-19 and mobile banking contributed to maintain social distancing by cashless uh, nature the following of the recommendation um, that i concluded from my research to the banks uh, to promote more uh, mobile banking transaction banks should assure and take necessary action to protect the data and privacy of customers mobile banking software should be made easily accessible by the users the transaction and uh, processing costs should be kept minimal and open to uh, and it should be open to feedback and work upon the suggestion and recommendation received from customers and i would like to conclude that technology innovation in banking sector look to be the right step in the direction of financial in inclusion the pandemic become a stepping stone for the future of this technology oriented banking service in india and 
and the growing number of smartphone users and internet service providing crystallizing the picture of growing future of mobile banking and smartphones in india this is all about my research thank you thank you we shall proceed now and uh, coming up next we have ms sunakshi verma from gautam buddha university greater noida elisa i am audible now yes you are Uh, I hope it's fun. Huh? Oh, I mean papers are only for the but the company is okay. Well, the paper can I tell? The paper does give a lot of things. The paper is only a company that is doing this. So he looks published for it. I hope my PPT is visible, right? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. so thank you so much for the opportunity aspm definitely and uh, welcome all the guest and all the presenter and attendee so my name is sunakshi verma and uh, uh, i am from gautam buddha university research scholar my supervisor dr neeti rana and i worked on my research paper study on job satisfaction of employee post covid uh, 19 pandemic so as we all know about the uh, covid situation so i'm just briefing about the covid what it's going what was the that the time has this paper will help you for the management of different sector to work on various factor affecting their employee satisfaction which in turn improve the organization productivity profitability and employee loyalty so if i'm talking about the second point it's like a during covid challenges what the employee face and normally in different different sector what is the employee faces the challenges uh, in work culture so if i can say so as per the shepherd 2020 paper 57% of employees satisfied with the work from home culture it mostly developed in covid 19 situation and the work from home practice has been employed widely as can be uh, seen in the us where study show in 2020 35.2% work post work from home increase and now the uh, uh, february 21 this paper 8.2% i'm coming on the second slide objective so uh, as my um, this is study objective employee who working from home face a home based work environment where they need to learn special special offices skill second work from home can make people feel isolated and can also lead to psychological stress is it a true or not so during an outbreak home based employer often face conflict between caring for their families and working and the fourth one home based employer often ignore the potential incentive of culture under the covid 19 crisis i'm coming on the rm part research methodology so this paper is based on the secondary uh, secondary research is totally based on the literature review studies so i took uh, 31 research paper on this study article 12 and a book two book i used for the on the study and online set 30% data used I, i used from the online sites so i'm coming on the literature review so i just mentioned only three major literature papers which published last year and last to last year during the covid time impact of hr practitioner hr practitioner reaction to the impact of work from home and what what the challenges work from home uh, people are faced i'm coming on my fourth uh, uh, this is the also the literature review part this is a very impressive impressive uh, study uh, article mc kids source covid 19 and the employee experience how leader can seize the movement by the jonathan and amit so 73% of employee enjoy enjoying work from home till now also and i can i can show you also 90 to 25% um, in march 49 and now 30 june 5 july 58% the ratio as per the uh, mc kinsey source and uh, definitely agree part is very high and disagree part is very low uh, in the work from home culture in organization i'm con completing uh, concluding my research paper so the, in in this like pandemic covid 19 has created a fear of the unknown all an individual ki how we will work and how we can uh, uh, daily basis how we satisfy our job also our manager also so this uh, definitely 
so many studies justify this uh, this uh, pattern work from home in covid situation so like globally including retail business affected because of lockdown and quarantine order to overcome the crisis retailer and in support their employee more than before they can have tangible support of employee and they can human resource in, in human resource also people are taking advantage of this uh, policy the study suggests that some human uh, human resource management can overcome the challenges by providing hygienic training session to the frontline employee ki how to work in online pattern what is the pol- how to use the new tools and technology to reduce the uh, work pressure also in uh, by the work from home pattern so executive succession planning with equity and justice to ensure organization deportation is not a stake initiating incentive plan all the level of retail organization and motivation to employ so thank you so much thank you so much this is it thank you ma'am next presenter for the day we have ms pooja singh from gautam buddha university greater noida heading forward i now call out dr arpita shrivastava dr arvind kumar bhat and mr vikram kumar sharma from gn bajaj institute of management and research greater noida Mm. very good afternoon everyone uh lisa my colleague uh, professor vikram sharma will be starting the presentation so can you give give the sharing right to him please hello uh, yes ma'am i was just doing okay. uh, dr ricky can you professor vikram vikram yeah uh, professor vikram yes yes sir i've already given him the pass okay okay ma'am he has been given Professor Vikram, you can share the screen, or otherwise I will share the screen. Just, just a minute. Uh, that will be better. Yeah, he's there. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Uh, Vikram, you can share the screen, please. Ma'am, you can uh, you will share. Ah, uh, I'm I'm trying. Different. My my slides are open, but I'm trying to share it. Uh, just a minute. I'll try once again. But I can go to share. Can anybody please help me out? I have opened the PPT. It is there. It is open. But when I'm uh, ma'am, there's an arrow. Ma'am, we need to. Uh... Yeah, I've, I've, that, I've. After that, you need to go to the PPT directly, where it is there in the, you know, below. Okay, now it is vis- visible. No, no, you need to uh, share your screen first, then you need to go to your PPT. Okay, let me try. Let me try. No, yeah, we can even try because. Um... Yeah. Is it visible now? Uh, yeah, now it's visible. Hmm. See, acha, yeah, you can, you can start. Yes. It's okay. Yeah, is it? It is visible. Is it visible in the full screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Ma'am, I request please make it very short because I am running out of time. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yes. Sure. 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 So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, Vikram Kumar Sharma, Assistant Professor at GL Bajaj Institute of Management and Research. Uh, I, along with my fellow colleague, uh, Dr. Apita Shrivastava, is here to present our paper, uh, adapting an innovative digital marketing strategies for new norm. right so uh, uh, today we are going to discuss about the introduction purpose of the paper then we will talk about transferring marketing priorities and goals uh, in this new covid uh, then digital disruptions key lessons learned from the crisis and ultimately we will end our presentation with the conclusion part okay let me just uh, uh, quickly introduce you to the topic why uh, we people have gone through that research why uh, uh, why we people have uh, done uh, something significant in that area uh, in order to help the industry and the individuals in academics to carry forward their research in the future so uh, what happened was uh, uh, at the start of the 2021 everybody was so uh, aspirational that uh, that uh, that we are about to leave behind this covid crisis and the industries are about to restart their overall scenario and they are looking for a new strategy to market their 
products and to gain new customers. Uh, but what happened was during March uh, 2021, second wave of COVID has actually thrust the uh, thrust all the plannings of the uh, new, of, of new of the industries to gain uh, uh, those new consumers. Now, uh, uh, during this uh, new normal, what we found was uh, that companies who were able to uh, uh, go according to the needs of the customers, who who are going to who, who are actually uh, planned their strategies according to the needs and wants of the customers. Uh, they have found that there was 84% surge uh, in their profits and that uh, that data is being quoted by me uh, according to a report by Forbes. So, uh, so the companies uh, in this new normal have to uh, have to look look forward to new strategies in the uh, in this new normal. They have to go for, for innovative approaches rather than traditional approaches because what we have seen that 44% of the businesses were able to uh, fail during this uh, during this COVID. They have found that their it, it was difficult to run their businesses. Their businesses have slowed down, and in fact. Uh, if we say there are 26% businesses who are actually uh, not able to perform uh, during this COVID and they have to shut down their operations. So what we have found during our research was uh, that that the consumer behavior during this COVID was changing uh, peculiarly. Now the consumers uh, which actually want that physical interaction with the industry or with the businesses now have to rely on that online interaction with the businesses. Now, uh, now, this is something the industries or the businesses have to look for and to strategize uh, in this new normal. This digitalization is that key that is going to be the uh, uh, success mantra for the industries uh, in the future. Now, uh, we will talk about the key performance indicators in this, uh, in this region. So, uh, going by the purpose of the paper, as far as uh, the uh, the agenda of this conference is building resilience, the way forward focuses on building resilience in this. Uh, our paper is going to discuss about the digital innovations in the area of marketing adopted by the corporate leaders in this new normal. Okay, uh, here is some interesting data which we have found during our research. Now, uh, during this new normal, the KPIs, that is the key performance in indicators, have changed uh, in a significant manner. Uh, when we look at this data, we found that 56% of the businesses, they are saying that digital transformation is the new KPI. That means if they are not able to change their uh, key performance indicators in line with that digital transformation, it will be difficult for them to run their business operations. Uh, again, 54% of the businesses have have seen that their, their focus is placed more on driving short term sales rather than planning for long term because in this uh, new normal we are not aware what to expect in the coming months or maybe in the coming years. So that's why uh, this uh, trend of short term selling has increased to a new level. Then 37% uh, they have found their shift towards ROI maximization. Now uh, during this COVID there is an interesting, interesting figure that the budget of the organizations is being shrinking. But the idea is to gain maximum out of that shrinking amount is actually let uh, corporates to develop new strategies. Uh, then moving on, uh, we looked at 24%. There is a shift from short term to long term uh, perspectives. That means the companies who are uh, denying themselves that opportunity to sell uh, in a short term is actually lagging behind the companies who are uh, who are selling in short term. Okay. Moving on. Uh, there are some uh, here are some interesting data uh, connected to that Forbes study, uh, which uh, which is 50 stats that prove the value of the customer experience. Companies that have embraced uh, digital transformation are 26% more profitable than their peers. That means the companies uh, who are able to change their uh, uh, change their mode of operations from physical to the digital transformation has actually able to get more profitability in comparison to their competitors 65 percent of the companies are uh, are saying that uh, uh, if we say that data is the new oil uh, this disruption of covid has proved it uh, yet again that 65% of the companies has actually realized that data analysis is very important to deliver a better consumer experience in the coming future. 62% of the marketing leaders said use of online customer data or their forms increased in the last two years. 
uh, because of that new normal or because of that COVID-19, uh, the physical interaction has gone for a toss. That is the reason why market leaders have said that online customers are uh, the uh, the traffic of online customers are increasing to a new levels, and that's why they they have to uh, strategize according to they cater those customers in a new mode. Uh, okay, now uh, uh, in order to continue with these slides, I'll request my fellow colleague Dr. Arpita Srivastava to continue, please. Uh, Arpita, I think you are on mute. Thank you, Dr. Vikram. Um, so thank you, Professor Vikram, for for uh, starting uh, giving the introduction about the paper as shared by uh, Professor Vikram. That paper actually talked about the digital uh, need of digital innovation, which happened in the era of COVID-19. So I just take direct. Uh, I'll not waste much of the time. I'll take directly to your thought: digital disruption, which is which has happened in the area of marketing, and which has actually proved this time that if uh, companies need to digitize or they need to or they, they will they will perish right so there's a first digital dis disruption which has happened is talking about the augmented reality as uh, covid has given given a lesson to the pe to the people uh, specifically i'm talking about marketers that uh, consumers behaviors have been changed they want they, they want everything um, at their at one click so companies like amazon l'oreal they have used a lot of augmented reality in terms of creating the same kind of environment to have a better engagement with the customers only a click away so customers need to move need not to move from the places to go to the market but they can experience the kind of product with the with the help of augmented reality another digital disruption which is taking place i think which each one of you as who are present in this conference can easily witness that is ott platform right so if you say that um, there's a there's a study conducted by kpmg that they says that kind of um, uh, acceleration or kind of pace what they are looking forward uh, in ott platform uh, which actually should happen in 2030 it is or they are predicting it will happen by 2028 because covid on one way they have um, uh, covid is actually affected the social and mental and health issue of a consumer but, but on the other way around it has also created, given a digital pace to the indian marketers even even talking about indian um, economy per se third disruption which is taken is, is talking about the gamification so gamification marketing actually involved in incorporating a lot of gaming element in non gaming content to improve a lot of customer engagement so this is a gamification which already started being being used by the marketer before covid but actually covid has given them a time to have lot experiment with gamification and uh, companies have have got a very good experience by using gamification uh, in their in, in their website and even for launching the new product this is another model which has emerged in this digital in this covid time is o2o2o that is offline online online offline model so he, if you can see there's so many companies if you say that they have now not only moving from offline even to online mode and offline because they find when we talk about the customer moment of truth the customer is entirely as shared by my fellow colleague vikram that consumer behavior is entirely changed so it is not like that the consumer will go to online uh, website and buy a product even consumer now want to experience experience it in offline mode also so con so marketers need to understand to have a kind of model where consumer can get a a kind of experience both in online offline and even offline mode also right so this is a new I'm thing sorry to interrupt you dr apita uh, yeah. as your time is uh... okay I, I will take last yeah. one minute sir in shop Good. demos has also become a, uh, an, another innovation in the in area of digital then coming to intelligence creative and yes last but not the least the major innovation which has taken place is talking about moving from uh, single retailing moving to multi multiple retailing and now consumers are looking forward for omni channel retail so this is something which has happened in the area of marketing and yes that so many companies have already work upon it now moving to what are the key lessons learned from the crisis okay, next slide please next slide um, if you talk about the key lessons learned from the crisis, the very important lesson what marketers has learned from this COVID crisis is that COVID-19 has already accelerated digitization. So need of the R is to digitize all marketing trans transaction if marketers want to have a 
better customer engagement and if they want to give value to the value of value to money to the customer itself next slide side please so uh, earlier having di digital uh, innovation or digitization is good to have now it has become a must to have virtual has, has become a new reality and last but not, the, but not the least when we are talking about customization it is not only product offering customization it is also using data analytics in customization in customization in terms of reaching to the customer that i think we all experiencing when we are getting a customized advertisement for the brands rather than getting getting a generalized uh, advertisement for for certain brands so this is all about the our paper thank you thank you very much if any question we are open for question thank you very much thank you ma'am i request the audience to post their question in the chat box thank you ma'am for your amazing presentation coming up next we have dr yogendra nath man and dr kavindra nath man retired assistant general manager state bank of india and former associate professor banking and finance moving forward we have ms punyata biswal and dr arpita biswal from rd women's university odisha moving forward i call out ms rani jha from arka jain university jharkhand hello am i audible yes ma'am you are miss rani you can proceed with yeah. your presentation yes yeah, sir uh, uh, good evening everyone i am rani jha from arkajan university research scholar uh thanks for giving me opportunity to present the, my paper my paper topic is covid-19 offers an opportunity to reform mental health in india can you repeat one second one second tell them to wait now Ask them if 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 they can access the screen. Sir, can you access the screen? I mean, can you see what it is? Is it visible? No, yes. we cannot. We need to share your screen, the PPT. Ma'am, you just have to click for the PPT. Your PPT is on. We can see your screen, ma'am. But there is a PPT. You just have to click on that PPT. Is it is it is it visible, ma'am? No, screen is visible, but the PPT is not visible. PPT is not visible. Yes. Kindly uh, click on the PPT. Click on the PPT. What are you sharing a window? Is it visible now, ma'am? No, ma'am. It's not visible, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay, now I know. Now. Is it visible now, ma'am? Ah, uh, um, Miss Rani, is your PPT open? Yes, it's open. Yeah, then go to there. Go there. Click there. Below, below. Go there. Ah. It's sharing a window, sir. Written, you sharing, you need to click on the PPT. It will be open. Then you go. Need to go to the PPT. No need of uh, being there in the screen. Okay. okay. Then you can you can stop sharing. You can go ahead with your presentation. I mean, you can uh, speak on the topic. So we can uh, unshare the screen. Okay. Yeah. मेरा 
Uh, sir, my topic is COVID-19 offers an opportunity to reform mental health in India. Uh, since COVID-19, uh, the pre-COVID-19 scenario for mental health in India was green. One in seven Indians had mental disorders of varying severity in 2017. And Indians accounted for 26.6% of the global suicide death in 2016. The proportional contribution of mental disorders to the total disease burden in India is estimated to have almost doubled between 1990 and 2017. And 5.1% of the adult population is estimated to have some level of suicidality. Like elsewhere, the variety and extent of the implication of the COVID-19 pandemic for mental health are yet to be fully understood in India. The introduction is this, that since its launch in 1982, the men National Mental Health Program in India has undergone many strategic revisions. With the National Mental Health Policy guiding its most recent revision, most researchers since then has detailed the issues and gaps in diagnosis and treatment of mental disorders under the National Mental Health Program. The program the program has also been criticized for being treatment centric and ignoring preventive and promotive aspects. However, because of the spotlight on mental health issues arising amid COVID-19, some noteworthy guidelines for prevention activities have been released by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare during the past few months to address mental health in India under the guidance of the National Task Force for the Finalization implementation and monitoring of the psychological action plan for COVID-19 response. Advocacy in mental health. The development of an advocacy movement could facilitate the implementation of mental health policy and legislation, and population could receive many benefits. The needs of persons with mental disorder could be better understood and their rights could be better protected. They could receive services of improved quality and could participate actively in their planning development, monitoring, and resolution. Families could be supported in their roles as carriers and population at large could gain an improved understanding of mental health and disorder. Mental health in diverse India. There are huge regional differences in mental health issues and the challenges in the mental health in India remain to stigma reduction, conducting research on efficiency of early intervention, reaching the unreached gender sensitive services, making quality mental health care accessible and available suicide prevention, reduction of substance abuse, implementing insurance for mental health, and reducing out-of-pocket expense, and finally improving care for homeless mentally ill. All this requires sustained advocacy aimed at promoting rights of mentally ill persons and reducing the stigma and discrimination. It consists of various actions aimed at changing the attitudinal barriers in achieving positive mental health outcomes in the general population. Challenges faced by community level workers. Community level. Stigma towards mental illness in the community and reducing this stigma are huge challenges since it affects not just the patient but entire family. Medicologist treatment is more acceptable and often the first line of help causing a prolonged prolongation of untreated disorder, educating and convincing the family relatives and community to seek medical treatment is sometimes a big task. Several side effects of medication, like uh, sometimes what happens so if, if uh, in one patient some side effects uh, occurs you know, in a, uh, by the drugs, so they will spread this in, uh, locally and every to, the, to whom they may so don't take this medicine. And due to this, Many the death can also caused by physical health issues. Happen the CLWS are held responsible. This sometimes results in abuse of the community level workers. Difficult to educate the employer to provide jobs for person with mental health disorder, especially with physical uh, Miss, uh, sorry to interrupt, Miss Rani. Can you uh, conclude with your remarks? Finally, the last one. What do you feel? Uh, 
conclusion is that the COVID-19 pandemic offers the opportunity to broaden the reach and scope of national mental health program activities through engagement with a wide range of stakeholders within and beyond healthcare, including sectors in education, workplaces, social welfare, gender empowerment, child and youth services, criminal justice and development, and humanitarian assistance, the National Mental Health Program needs to consider how emerging digital technologies, which have shown promise in countries that have a low investment in mental health services and low capacity bearing, might support the scale up of mental health treatment and prevention efforts to manage the gap between supply and demand for treatment. Lastly, because the mental health consequences is expected to be given Thank for you. longer than the COVID-19 pandemic itself, now is also the time for mental health care delivery to transfer towards an ethic of nothing about us without us. With meaningful participation by serving future in the strengthening of mental health system. So we should be uh, very much uh, careful for this COVID-19 uh, which has created, uh, which has reformed for mental health. So we should take uh, preventive measures and uh, some uh, policies like government has uh, given like uh, if some uh, children have died, uh, children has left and uh, their parents are died. So we should, uh, they should get admission in other, uh, in some colleges, schools, they should get facility. So this type of uh, uh, steps should be taken by uh, the community and by the government and uh, with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Thank you so much. So heading to the last presenter for the day, we have Dr. Hetal Mehta and Dr. Suresh R. Savani from Swami Sajnanda College of Commerce and Management, Gujarat. Ma'am, I request you to stop presenting your screen. Ms. Rani Jha, I request you to stop presenting your screen. Thank you. So we have completed all the paper presentation and thank you to all the participants. I now request my colleague and master of the ceremony, Shadhan Alam Khan, to continue with the session. Thank you, Nisha. I now request Professor Sok Uttara to sum up the overall presentation and share his insight with us. Well, thank you very much, Shadan and Lisha, for your very um, patient and uh, effective uh, coordination of the session. And thank you very much, all presenters, for doing your best to uh, uh, point out the important findings in your research and uh, stay with us from the beginning to the end. Uh, a lot of topics were presented and uh, each uh, topic uh, yielded uh, a lot of uh, important findings that uh, uh, are very important for all of us uh, to to learn from. Um, I could uh, see the, uh, the, 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 main, the, the main points uh, covered in all these topics are very consistent to what uh, Professor Azam uh, indicated in his uh, uh, short speech in the beginning. Um, these topics uh, presented today covered different levels of uh, resilience, the in individual resilience, the organizational resilience, the uh, national resilience, global resilience. Uh, so um, th these topics uh, presented today have been very, very useful for for all of us um the uh we also should look at the curriculum that uh, empowers the uh the uh stakeholders uh inputs uh because uh, the resilience is connected to uh to everybody not a particular person but everybody so it's a consorted efforts to uh, build resilient ability 
at the individual levels and also organizational level. Um, it is also important to get support from the uh, policymakers at the national level so that the, uh, the concerted efforts made at the individual levels and uh, organizational levels uh, will be possible for implementation. Uh, it is also important to uh, make sure that uh, the national policies in terms of uh, building resilience uh, uh, capacities at the in institutional level and also national level are uh, consistent with the uh, global trend. And uh, so it is important to uh, benchmark the uh, what's happening in, in the world as the uh, new the new normal the new normal uh, standard of living the new normal standard of uh, uh, work performance so uh, to sum up i would like to uh, uh, say a short just a short sentence that uh, uh, resilience is uh, uh, joint effort joint responsibility of everybody every institution every nation in the world. So uh, let's uh, stand up together, build resilience um, together. And so we will be able to address our uh, challenges in this new normal world. So uh, thank you very much, the organizing committee. Thank you, uh, the president. Thank you, uh, Lisha Singh, uh, Shadan Alam, Professor uh, Azam, for all your uh, efforts. This is a sign and this is uh, an example of resilience uh, already. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Sandal, one second. Thank you, Professor. This is Kalyan Shankar Rai, Vice Chancellor of the University. I have heard lots about you from Dr. Bissuji for time. It's a pleasure. To be to online. Hope you are fine. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope we'll be meeting next year when you conduct the conference, the regional conference of ACDS. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, sir. Yeah. For the summing of the session, I now request Dr. Koshik and Guya, co coordinator of the conference, to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Shadan. Am I audible? Yeah, Kosi, you are audible. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Apprehension of internal route mapping is the ultimatum to recover quickly from any difficult situations, and that is self retrospection. Uh, building resilience, the self resilience, all rolled into one, which is when uh, very aptly, pertinently, visible in all the presentation today in this particular session. So, first of all, huge congratulations to all the paper presenters in this session for your deliberations. Uh, I take this opportunity to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. So Kutara and uh, Dr. Abul H. Ajam for chairing the session. It was indeed a very privileged moment and listening to you all, sir, in this, uh, in this particular session. And I'm sure your observation and suggestion have been hugely been received by the participants, well received. I would also like to thank our beloved president and chair of the conference, Professor Vishwajit Patai, for being the architect of this international conference. I also thank our vice chancellor and co-chair of the conference, uh, Professor Kalyan Shankar Rai and Pro VC, Professor Falgun Niranjana, for their timely advice and support uh, for the success of the conference. I would also like to thank the convener, co-coordinator of the conference, technical support team, academic and administrative staff, uh, student volunteers and the student masters of ceremony for their all-round support and assistance for their successful completion of the event. Uh, thank you everyone for your presence and with this we conclude the session and looking forward to meeting you soon physically with many more such endeavors in the future. Thank you so much. Namaste from SB University. Thank you. Thank you very much everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tara.